Okay, Tessa, if you if you'd like to start. Okay, so hello everybody, and uh, welcome to this event on sustainable community-led housing. Uh, we're the Kent Community Housing Hub. My name's Tessa, and I'm the hub manager. Um, we support community-led housing groups throughout their projects through um, early stages and technical advice programs, raise awareness and run regular events and training on various topics relating to community-led housing. And uh, you can find out more on our website. Um, so environmental sustainability is still unfortunately not nearly high enough on the agenda of the majority of big market developers. We're not seeing homes built on scale at the sustainability level that's needed. But most community-led housing groups are concerned and want to develop truly sustainable homes and environments, and they're really in an ideal position to take this on board. So today we're very pleased to welcome the Sustainable Design Collective, South Dartmoor Community Energy, and Harberton and Harberton Ford CLT to talk about their involvement in this agenda and the very important aspects of developing sustainable housing. So I'm just going to run you through a few points for today. So um, please ensure your microphones are on mute. Um, as we go along, you can type questions into the chat box, um, or you can also use the raised hand drop option during the Q&A sessions. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, contact Hannah Howes via the direct message in chat, or just put it in chat. Um, we'll try and pick everything up. There's quite a lot of people here, so we do our best to get all the questions um, through to the speakers. Um, so this is the agenda for the day. Um, we're going to hear from the three speakers first, followed by a Q&A session. Then we'll have a quick break. And after that, we're running there's workshops to choose from. So you can choose uh, for the first session, you can choose um, from planning or funding. These will be in breakout rooms. And the second session uh, will be sustainability or self-building, self-design. And then we'll finish off with a sort of closing discussion session at the end. So that's it for me. I'm going to hand over to Kirsty, who's the hub coordinator. Thank you, Tessa. Um, so as you can see, we have got quite a feature pack session for you today, which I hope you all enjoy. Um, just a reminder that this session is being recorded and it will be made available um, via a hidden link on our new YouTube channel. And um, that link will be sent out to you all in a day or so after the end of the session. Um, as Tessa says, please do add your questions to the chat as we go along. Um, once we get into the Q&A session, um, if you'd prefer to ask a question there and then, please raise your hand. Um, and we're gonna start our session today by welcoming Donald Brown from Sustainable Design Collective for his presentation. Donald, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, it's really a pleasure to be here today. Uh, we just wanted to tell you a bit about the community-led housing projects that we're involved in and a little bit about us first. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just hope everyone's seeing my screen. Oh, it's done that thing where I need to swap. Is everyone seeing my main screen or the-, uh, the We've notes? got your notes as well, Donald. Done that again, sorry. Top displays. There we go. I'll do some that. So hi, yeah, we're, we're Sustainable Design Collective. Uh, we are an architecture and uh, eco consultancy practice. Um, we have historically uh, provided a design and build service. We do a number of sort of one-off uh, small eco schemes, and we're recently um, much more involved in the community-led housing space. Um, we are an advocate of kind of passive house type approaches, but we're not kind of dogmatic about that as a route. Uh, we sort of advocate sustainable materials with kind of whole life sustainability in the design approach that we adopt. Um, and I think also to emphasize, we really see sustainability as not just about sort of the environment, but also about uh, social sustainability and making sure that housing is affordable um, and kind of kept uh, in such a way that people and communities can remain together and communities can kind of keep uh, their, their rural character. So. Oops, oh geez. So we've been going since uh, 1998. We're a family business. Sadly, uh, my dad, Bill, can't be with us today. He's not feeling too well. 
uh, but you'll hear from myself uh, and our architect, Jonathan Evans. Um, yeah, we've, we've, we've been knocking around for a while and we're kind of moving towards really focusing almost solely on uh, community-led housing projects. It's, it's just basically, we, we enjoy working on them much more than most of everything else we do. So uh, yeah, that's mostly what you'll hear from, uh, from us today. Um, yeah, we've, we've, we've done a fair number of, of community land trust projects, uh, community-led housing projects, uh, the usual spiel about having some sort of award-winning schemes, both at a kind of high-end level, but also uh, we've done social housing in the past, which has won awards, um, but really our, our focus is, is increasingly on community-led housing. So we're going to hear from three, uh, sorry, two of our community-led housing uh, clients today. The first is South Dartmoor Community Energy, which uh, is down in the West Country in Devon. Um, it's a 30 house site. We'll hear much more about that in a minute. Um, that's just gone into planning. Um, uh, yeah, that's a sort of 3D view of, of the scheme. Um, yeah, it's it's a lovely sort of site on the edge of Dartmoor. Uh, we were originally based in Devon, um, and we have a kind of split of projects between Devon uh, and also sort of Kent and Sussex, where the office is now based. Although increasingly we're kind of looking to cover most of southern England with this sort of specialist approach, uh, that, you know, so very keen to work with partners in Kent uh, where possible. So we really seem to like me pressing the arrow. Um, this is our, our oldest community-led housing scheme. This is the Hobbs and Hobbs and Ford Community Land Trust. Um, this is 12 houses for uh, affordable ownership. Um, what's interesting about this one is that we also have a renewable energy microgrid proposed on the scheme, as well as uh, features like green roofs. Uh, we're actually kind of doing quite a lot of habitat restoration on that, so you'll hear more about that one as well. Um, and we're also working with a housing co-op up in London, uh, which is a um, Victorian mansion, which is currently owned by the, uh, the Drive Housing Co-op. We're basically looking to um, add a new building in the garden, and hope the co-op basically looking to expand their membership. So we're going to build a new kind of eco building in the garden, and then we're going to deep retrofit the, uh, the existing mansion and kind of do some remedial work so that's more um, yeah more habitable. We also get involved in the build so we, we have historically uh, worked with off-site manufacture techniques so that's where uh, homes are kind of prefabricated usually with timber and natural materials off-site um, brought to site and kind of loaded in um, quite rapidly we find this is a really good way of uh, speeding up the process and also getting kind of a high level of quality reducing waste uh, homes can be up in one to two days and often wind and water site within a week. So obviously when you're assembling off site, you can get a lot of the work um, that needs to be done in, in sort of on the site and groundworks done in parallel. Um, and that's an approach we advocate. It's not the only approach we, we adopt, but uh, it, we think it's a good, good route of the community led and that sort of social housing projects. So yeah, just to summarize, um, you know, we, we aim really to offer a kind of wraparound service. So help from finding land, uh, accessing funding, funding sort of work, work. Oh, somebody speaking. Um, yeah, helping kind of getting your legal and governance uh, arrangement, what kind of legal structure you want to adopt, whether it's a CLT or other routes. Uh, obviously we provide architecture services our kind of main focus. Um, my sort of specialism is in the sustainability bits and you'll hear a bit more about that later. Uh, helping to kind of get uh, low energy and other kind of environmental goals uh, brought forward. And that's also very important for, for planning. So we, we will take a scheme through planning, support in the build, and then and then eventually hand over and completion. And different groups are working with a sort of taking a, a different approach. Some are looking to self-finish some of the schemes, so uh, where people are actually doing some of the work themselves. Other, others are taking more of a kind of turnkey route uh, and, and effectively are going to be handed the keys at the end. So. That's us. Um, I think now, are we going to hear from uh, South Dartmoor next, is it? We are. Thanks for that, Donal. Um, certainly when I first come, uh, came across Sustainable Design Collective, I lost a good hour and a bit going through your website and looking at all those beautiful buildings. So, um, yeah. Uh, right. OK, so next we are going to hear from Sophie Phillips from South Dartmoor Community Energy along with Jonathan Evans from Sustainable Design Collective, who are going to um, give us a short presentation. So Sophie and Jonathan, over to you now. Hi everyone. Um, yes, yeah, Sophie and I are doing a joint presentation. We've been working together and I, this will be 
mainly Sophie presenting kind of what they're doing as South, Dart the South Dartmoor Community Energy and how, how they're trying to develop genuinely affordable housing. Um, I'll just share the slides and um, hand over to Sophie. Great, thanks, Jonathan. Can everyone see that? Hi. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks very much for having us here um, on the other side of the country. Um, it's nice to talk to you over there. Um, sorry about the date on the slide. Uh, we kind of from a presentation that we did for a webinar earlier uh, last year. So um, my name is Sophie Phillips. I'm one of the directors at South Dartmoor Community Energy. And uh, we're not a community land trust, we're a community benefit society and a community energy company. Um, but we wanted to, to get involved with housing. So the kind of idea of our project is housing, energy and mobility as well as a service. So can you move on, Jonathan, please? Yeah, this is kind of our ethos for, for the housing, eco-affordable, future-proof and 2050 ready homes. Um, so, as I said, yeah, we're a community benefit society. Uh, at, we're not for profit and um, we grew out of the local transition town initiative in Ivy Bridge, which is a kind of a, sm a large town on the edge of Dartmoor in the South Hams. It sounds like it's pretty, but it's full of uh, new estates that were built in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and now as well. So, um, yeah, it's a bit of a mixture. Um, these are our seven directors. Sorry, I'm still going, Jonathan, on that one. <laughs> um, are you able to go back? Thanks. Yeah, so we've got seven directors and all our directors are voluntary and we do uh, project work, which is grant funded. Our main aims are about mitigating climate change and alleviating fuel poverty. Thanks. Go to the next one. Thank you. So we've done a lot of fuel poverty work, so energy advice and all of our projects are grant funded and we work with loads of different partners um, in the local authority and in the health and social care sector and also we do now kind of climate action projects in schools. Um, so can you move on to the next one please? So you might be asking why is community energy want to get involved in housing? And it was basically because we saw so many people living in fuel poverty in new houses and in houses that were just had inappropriate heating systems and we saw new housing being built that's not fit for purpose in for 2050 it's not going to be decarbonized um, and we wanted to do something about that and we also knew that there's a need for affordable and social housing in our local area so our kind of big aim is to tackle this business as usual house building idea and also provide sustainable living for, for our social housing um, part of our community in, in Ivy Bridge. And we kind of want to show a different way of building new housing that can benefit people and the planet as well. Thanks Jonathan. So this is the scheme, the idea we came up with. Um, 30 passive house homes. Uh, we've got a site um, which is a rural exception site, so it's outside of the joint local plan, um, but it's possible to build affordable homes on it if there's a local need. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's our site and the site can accommodate, it can accommodate more than 30 homes, but we wanted lots of lovely green spaces as well to kind of enable communal living and for people to have outside areas to just enjoy nature basically and the fact that we're on the edge of Dartmoor and we've got it's a sloping site and it looks out across the South Hams it's a really um, great site really and kind of in direct contrast to one of our local councillors district councillors recently who commented that all social housing ought to be built in the centre of Plymouth on Brownfields land um, which is not great so we're doing kind of the opposite of that of providing some social housing in a beautiful space and why shouldn't it be there? Uh, we've also want to have a, a communal hub building which has got some workspaces so people can work from home but not actually in their homes and uh, it's got a meeting room and a guest suite upstairs for people to rent. We're also going to have shared electric cars and bikes so uh, we know that many of our future tenants will probably not have access to a car at all but we're in a rural area so if we can help them by providing 
a shared EV that they can hire for a couple of hours if they need to. Um, it gives them more options for the transport because our, our yeah, public transport's not ideal in this area yet. We're going to have solar PV on all of the roofs as well, so tenants will have access to zero carbon electricity and of course we're doing meadow roofs and lots of nature spaces and aiming for biodiversity net gain as well on the site. Thanks Jonathan. And I, I think is this the point where I hand over to to you now? Yeah, great. Yeah, um, I'll, um, I'll just quickly run through, um, yeah thanks Sophie, that was a uh, good background and I think I'll just quickly run through the design itself and the sort of briefly design process. I'll be talking a bit more about the planning application process in one of the breakout rooms. Um, and I don't want to take up too much time here but uh, all of those ideas that um, Half Dartmoor Community Energy um, are kind of approached us with just form this kind of wonderful scheme really where we've got lots of green spaces and we're trying to bring kind of ecological features back into the site as one of the primary kind of um, design drivers. We've also got solar roofs um, on all of the buildings and um, the, the landscaping is probably the kind of key feature really where these shared spaces kind of um, work across the site. So as you can see this uh, this is a sketch that was done as part of the design process. There's, there's wildlife ponds, there's the community hub, we've got um, car club parking. Um, probably an important point actually to raise is that all of the parking is, is kind of um, away from the buildings. We wanted to reduce the amount of hard landscaping really. So, and to emphasize that sense of kind of shared ownership and community um, by not kind of having everyone with their individual kind of driveways, if you like, it's, it's a lot more to do with communal ownership. And we want people to be able to feel like they can, they can uh, join in in the communal outdoor life as well here. Yeah, yeah there's um, terrace houses with two, three or four bedrooms generally, and um, apartments, uh, flats with on the ground floor, fully accessible um, dwellings and uh, one bed kind of flats uh, on the upper levels of those. Yeah, um, that's the next slide. This is just the site plan as it was developing, uh, just mentioning some of the key features there. Um, and again, this idea of designing around courtyards to, to make it um, feel, uh, give it a sense of shared space. Uh, these are some of the kind of present images that we wanted to, to show to, to get a sense of how the, the site might feel. Um, looking at the design of the terrace houses, uh, Donna mentioned we, we uh, specialise in kind of passive house kit houses and that's really the way we, we would like to go on this project here to um, hopefully, you know, do something which is cost effective uh, and, you know, we are looking at uh, social housing so we need to think about affordability at every stage really and cost. Um, we are still trying to create generous dwellings, um, generally trying to get 10% more than the um, space standards requirements. And, and perhaps most importantly, these will be highly efficient and comfortable dwellings um, with low, and low running costs. Uh, similarly, for the apartment buildings, um, with the ground floor one being fully accessible there, yeah, and again, it's highly efficient. Uh, we use natural materials uh, as standard and, and this scheme is no exception, We're generally using render and timber cladding. Um, I won't go into that too much just yet. Uh, the construction being a prefabricated timber frame with warm cell blown insulation is, is uh, quite a standard passive house style um, way of building now. And um, we're looking into offsite as a way of, as, of speeding up the build process as well and reducing waste. Um, passive house principles are used on all of our projects really where it's, where it's necessary or where it's appropriate, I should say. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with passive house uh, design, so I won't go into that in too much detail, but we are now at the detailed design stage looking into the feasibility of whether these buildings can actually be passive house. Um, with RCEF funding studies being done to, to try and figure that out. Um, we use, we're proposing to use timber frame and there will be 
quite a good deal of embodied carbon in this scheme and again natural materials in the actual construction for insulation internal finishes both help to sequester carbon and also provide an inter a healthy internal environment and that's the final scheme as developed for planning um, I think I'll go into that in a bit more detail in, in the breakout rooms uh, rather than talking about that too much now because I think we're running out of time and I just want to hand back over to Sophie as the roof plan showing all the PVs there's quite a lot of PV generation, which is great, and that feeds in nicely to Sophie's next slide. Great, thank you. Um, I also, just uh, if there's anybody in the audience who's thinking of, of doing community housing projects and is thinking, I don't know how to do that. Uh, we didn't know how to do it before we started, and there's tons of support out there. And yeah, um, Sustainable Design Collective have been amazing to work with. Uh, so I would just encourage you to be brave and, and yeah, take on all the advice you can, but you, you will be able to do it. Um, so yeah, going back to uh, our energy system, because we're a community energy company, that's a big part of it for us. So community energy organisations typically own like a solar farm or a wind turbine and local people can invest in that and it generates an income. And then the money is put back into any profits are put back into other community projects. Um, so all the PV on our roofs will be owned as a community project and we would like to have a microgrid. We're not as far ahead on this. I understand that Harbour and Ford are also doing a microgrid, so Joanne can probably tell you more about how that's going to work. But we want to have a, like a smart control system and the aim is to keep the costs as low as possible for the tenants and um, provide zero carbon electricity. And also we want to use to see, it's not commercially viable yet, but to trial if we can use vehicle to grid charging to help us balance that microgrid. Um, but yeah, this is all quite a detailed energy feasibility study that needs lots of extra separate funding that we're working through at the moment. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, this is just the kind of a keywords for the tenants. Uh, we want it to be low cost, green, convenient, easy, affordable, zero carbon. That's what we want people to feel, think about this site. Our original aim was to look at zero carbon living in one simple bundle for people. So to be, to be able to provide rent, energy and transport uh, in one bill. So we don't know if that's possible yet. And that's part of our energy feasibility study and working with our, trying to find housing association partners uh, to work with us in a different way to how they normally work. But yeah, this is, this is our aim for the project. Um, this is probably the same as most, um, community housing. We want to do 100% rental uh, because it's a rural exception site we have to be predominantly social housing um, and it's got to be a local connection. Uh, so our, our next steps, uh, we submitted the planning application at the end of December and it's now live on the planning portal so if anybody is willing it would be amazing if uh, you would be able to support our planning application. Um, where there'll be a link at the end of the presentation. We're expecting a decision in March and then yeah, lots of fundraising and lots of kind of other big decisions that we need to make as a, as a board of directors as well. And these dates keep getting pushed back and pushed back. So no doubt they'll get pushed back again, but ambitiously we could potentially break ground in early next year and people move in towards the end of next year if all goes well. What's the End. Yeah, yeah um, that's the end. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. Um, and that's a summary here. It was 30 homes for, for affordable rent. And um, yeah, I think the key message really is that it's, it's really the, the whole package, isn't it? It's, it's both social sustainability and environmental sustainability. And also we're trying to do as much as we can for the biodiversity on the site. Um, so yeah, I'll stop the screen share there. Lovely. Thank you, Sophie and Jonathan. Really great presentation there with loads of fantastic detail. Um, and um, Sophie and indeed um, going on Jonathan too, please do put your um, website addresses in the chat. There's um, a whole bunch of fantastic information, especially on the South Dartmoor Community Energy website. So that was great. Thank you. Right, moving on. Next, we have 
Joanne Tisdall from Harberton and Harberton Ford CLT, who's going to talk about their scheme. Joanne. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me see if I can screen share. Let's hope. Just bear with me a second. Let's see if I can do it on slideshow. Can everyone see that? Yes. Brilliant, thank you. So um, it's really interesting hearing about and uh, more about Sophie's scheme. Um, we're probably only about 20 minutes drive or something from Ivy Bridge and we um, are in the same uh, planning authority, South Ham's planning, uh, South Ham's district council, which is also really useful and obviously we share our, the same architect. So you'll see some similarities between our scheme and Sophie's, but also some differences. And um, just looking at the questions in the chat, I'm going to see if I can sort of pick up on some of those points and bring them out. You'll see, and um, this is a Google Maps view, obviously, of our scheme, and you can see that it's very rural. So Harberton is a, a very small and very beautiful old village outside Totnes. It's probably about four miles outside of Totnes. There's a huge amount of pressure on housing um, in and around Totnes. And um, our primary driver for our scheme was definitely um, about affordable homes rather than about energy uh, and about sustainability. And we've come to those things because it makes absolute sense if you're doing a new scheme and it makes no sense not to do it that way. So you can see in my uh, so that's actually where our site is and you can see it's contiguous with the village. It's not the whole field, it's about that bit if, if you can, if you'll see my cursor. We call it oak tree field because of the very beautiful oak tree up here and we are acquiring it from the local farmer whose family have, have farmed in the village uh, for many generations. Hopefully you can see the next screen. So, the screen. so we were set up too many years ago really for me to like to remember because it's taken us quite a long time uh, to get to where we are but we have actually got full and detailed planning permission which for our scheme which was a, a moment of incredible celebration. Um, we were set up as a community interest company and those of us who uh, those of you who joined my uh, talk on funding I'll talk a little bit about the importance of governance structures for funding. Uh, so Sophie's scheme is, 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 has a different sort of structure. Uh, we went for the CIC structure and that has been okay for everything we've wanted to do so far. As I said, we're in Harberton uh, outside Totnes. Um, again, like Sophie, it's a rural exception site. So this is a site that would not get uh, market value planning. It, 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 it just wouldn't uh, be brought into the um, local plan. Uh, as as a, as a fully commercial site and we were that's really important because if it was available for commercial planning purposes we would not be able to buy it at an affordable price and therefore we would not be able to build affordable homes that's really fundamental to the um, financial structure of the scheme um, so, and for rural exception sites, obviously there are lots of criteria that you have to fulfill. Being uh, contiguous uh, with current um, village infrastructure it is an important one. Um, this, is, this is, you can see the um, profile of our scheme, the, the elevation looking uh, at the slope, um, and this is the site plan. Um, so again, our, our scheme's a little different um, because it's actually uh, for shared ownership. Although some of the um, families on our scheme will only buy a very small equity share in their homes. And also key, it's self-finish. So we started out thinking of it as a stick build, uh, uh, which has been done uh, in and around Totnes. Um, but some very, very sensible um, members of the CLT who are actually carpenters and builders and so on said, absolutely, this isn't going to work. And our 
weather is so wet now in the winter, the idea of sort of wading around in mud for two years and having not much to show for it, we, we quite soon realised, and particularly when we're talking with SDC, that other solutions were much better. So we're going for a, a timber frame construction built off site and, and brought on site as, as Donald explained. Uh, there'll be passive house standard, but unless it's changed, Donald, I think not passive house certified because I think that is uh, is a premium, and we're all about building the cheapest houses possible for people. So this isn't about um, what the government says is affordable, which we're we're really looking to build houses that are about two thirds the cost of a of a market value house, and part of that. A big part of that cost saving is around the land costs. I uh, can't uh, overemphasise how important that is. Um, but obviously, some of the saving is going to be about uh, our homeowners finishing the houses themselves. The um, the fact that our homeowners will finish the houses themselves, so the interior and do a lot of the work, meant that we have pre-allocated our houses. So uh, we went through a process of allocation where people had to meet um, the criteria that were set by together with us and our local authority, South Hampshire District Council. And they were allocated using an independent body to do that. And that's worked really well. And the reason we pre-allocated was so that they could be involved in the co-design process with SDC, uh, which we did, which is, um, that was, on the site um, where the site is laid out uh, and it was also on some in, uh, some aspects of the houses and some in individualization of the houses. So we've got 10 affordable homes. We have one market value house which is for the CLT to sell to cross subsidize the scheme and as part of the village housing initiative in South Hams the landowner also gets a, a um, market value plot so they, the landowner can build a house on it and, and sell that, ski, that house for market uh, value. As part of the self-finish finish, um, uh, structure of our scheme, the original home builders, home finishers, will get some sweat, sweat equity for their, for their efforts, which is really important. And at the moment, we're probably looking at between 10 to 15 percent of the final house completed uh, cost as, as respect to equity and that does mean you'll all know that with with affordable homes their held has got to be affordable in perpetuity but it does mean that our home um, owners when they move on even if they haven't been paying a mortgage for a long time can take away some value that represents the work that they put into the houses so where have we got to? How much time? I just crack on. So, so this, it's been a long old road, but my recommendation is try not to look too much at the hard bits and everything on the way. Just put one step in front of the other. And um, I'll talk a bit about that in financing as well. So we were very fortunate. We were able to option this land due to the generosity of spirit, really, of, of the local farming family. Uh, I talked about the allocation. Um, we um, have got a section 106 agreed, not yet signed because we're waiting for the land purchase to happen, which we're currently uh, in the process of doing uh, and we, we got planning permission. So it's part of the journey has been, you'll probably, some of you will have done housing needs survey. Uh, Sophie talked about that in order to show that there is housing need in your community. Uh, we worked on the allocation criteria with South Hams District Council land option. We did a lot of fundraising to get through all those stages. We did a lot of community engagement. It's, it's a community project. Uh, we, um, when I say reports, 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 we commissioned endless reports to go towards our planning application, that survey, ecological surveys, loads of things, drainage surveys, you name it, we did it. It was really expensive, uh, but we got there. We we put in our planning application and lo and behold, we needed more reports, very specifically around transport. So our biggest problem, uh, which hopefully won't happen to your scheme, was to do with hi highways who objected and objected and objected to our scheme. Because um, I've got these lovely pictures on here, you can see that this is the access point through the village, the lane 
where our scheme sits and it's extremely narrow and um and this is not untypical in a devon village it's incredibly uh, typical as you can see you can't really widen it because there's very old houses on either side and that those uh, owners may very well object to their houses being knocked down so uh we we commissioned a transport survey where we had to demonstrate and successfully demonstrated that um, there would be very little impact on traffic. We also have an electric car club on our scheme. We, we did uh, surveys in the village. We had demonstrated there were no accidents at these junctions. They still um, objected at the planning committee, but happily for us, our scheme I think was so strong that we got an, we got a unanimous agreement for planning from all, from all councillors and it's a conservatively held council so um, so that that was a really good achievement so that's where we are and uh, I'm a rank amateur I have absolutely no clue uh, when I started out in this I, I was really brought in by the CLT because of experience running businesses and sort of stakeholder engagement and so on and uh, these are the amazing people that have uh, helped and supported us along the way. And I've actually put in the planning officer, which might surprise people here, uh, but our planning officer at Southampton District Council was actually fantastic. They really wanted to get the project over the line. And our affordable homes officer has also been amazing. And yes, happy to answer any questions. I'll hand that back. Lovely. Thank you very much, Joanne. A really good, good presentation there. I enjoyed that. Okay, so now we've heard from all the presenters and um, we're going to open up the floor for some questions um, for 10 minutes or so. We'll give it sort of 10, maybe 15 minutes before we're going to head into a, into a short break. Um, I ask that you keep your mics muted and let you speak in. And uh, raise your hand if you'd like to pose a question to our presenters. And again, any answers, any questions that we don't get answers for in this section will be collected up and we'll send a, an email round to everyone with either the, the answers or, or further links for information. So who, let's have a look actually and see what we've got in the chat here. There was a question about how much cheaper the land um, was, so whilst Joanne was presenting there, um, someone raised the question about land cost. So Joanne? Yeah, do you want me to talk about that in our land? I'm very happy to say mm -hmm. our land cost. So our, our, uh, each of our plots cost um, 9,500, including that. Okay. So, I, I don't know, I can't see your faces there, but I think what would the equivalent market value plot in in uh, in our part of the world would cost over £100,000. OK, all right, great, thank you. Um, another question I saw in the chat here was about water saving. Now, maybe this is something Donal's going to cover in the sustainability breakout room anyway, but... Someone's asked, water is quite a big part of people's bills as well as energy. Have you included water saving or grey water or rainwater recycling? And I think that was when Sophie was presenting. Do you want to take that question, Sophie? Um, we haven't uh, included any rainwater harvesting within the homes. Um, we've got, obviously we're having, we'll have water butts on every home um, to encourage water recycling outside. Um, but no, it's not something that that's been very much included in our project. Uh, Jonathan, do you have anything else to say on the? Uh, yeah, we looked into the kind of feasibility of rainwater harvesting. We actually had um, a lot of reports carried out as well. Drainage was a big, big thing on this on on, on our site. It was sloping down towards mm. the road, um, and the drainage designer of our scheme. Um, yeah, it wasn't considered kind of viable to include rainwater harvesting or particularly useful to include rainwater harvesting. So it would have been an extra cost that wouldn't necessarily benefit the uh, surface water drainage okay. on the site. Yeah, All so right. it, again, it came down it came down to cost saving, I think, really in the end about rainwater yeah. harvesting. But yeah, certainly rainwater is collected and encouraged to be used in all the gardening and this extensive landscaping there. So 
uh, yeah. should save a lot of water, as well as having water saving features in homes as sort of standard uh, sure. practice. Okay, great, thank you. Right, let's take a question from the floor. There's someone with a hand up there. Donald, sorry, did you want to say something? I was just going to re respond on that question. So in the past, we have done uh, rainwater harvesting. We did one for a four house social housing scheme. We did also in Devon five, six years ago. Um, can work really well. The trouble often is, is actually, you know, getting, negotiating savings, particularly, um, yeah, in terms of sort of your, your water bill, obviously getting on a water meter would help. Um, a lot of what we're doing, particularly on Joanne's scheme in Harbison, um, is around treating wastewater on site, probably through a three-stage treatment system because of the way the drains work. Uh, that is kind of, I think, at once a pragmatic approach, but also uh, is more, you know, we're going to be putting less waste into, into the already overloaded uh, drain system. Uh, and also, we, because of our green roofs, we'll be, uh, and general kind of permeable paving, uh, throughout, we'll probably be con well, we will be contributing a lot less towards uh, stormwater runoff. Kind of quite a lot. Of, it's very wet in Devon. There's a lot of issues with localised flooding, particularly at the bottom of valleys and in villages. Um, and so that's been a really, really big focus. Um, okay. I think rainwater harvest is a good idea in many circumstances, but yeah. it stacks up financially sometimes, not so much. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Yes, Beacon, you've got your hand up. What would you like to ask? Oh, well, I first wanted to check the, the, the land price stuff. Um, that is the nine thousand was per dwelling. Is that is that correct? Yeah, it's per plot. Yeah, per, per plot. Dwelling. Per plot. Nine, yeah, nine and a half. Goodness, 000, yeah. goodness me! I hope many, many more people can do that because in uh, around York, where I live, it, it's uh, the planning going on a plot is about two hundred grand. So you plot yeah. five hundred quid's worth of. Uh, agricultural land becomes worth 200 by by the signature um, i think this is amazing. why rural exception yeah it's why the rural exception site is so key because i said they're not available for market homes so so the landowner can only um sell them at a, for affordable home schemes well, well let's so have, let's have a million or two um uh, exception sites then um the the, the other issue is uh, you're isolated from a, a big town which means um you, you're going for electric cars but electric cars are still not um there are a lot of embodied energy in them and uh, uh, there are about 25 tons of carbon dioxide per uh, for the average electric car um are you doing anything to any else to cut cut this heavy load, like um, encourage very much smaller micro transport uh, on your narrow lanes, or including tr trying to encourage facilities near you so people have a local shop rather than having to drive to a supermarket? Well, I mean the villages village as it were and it is about homes for that village I mean we just to be clear that we're not insisting that our homeowners have electric cars but they will be able to charge their cars and we've got a solar microgrid scheme as Donald mentioned uh, we and we also have a car uh, we're going to put a car club on which all everyone in the village can use obviously not just yeah. people on the on the scheme yeah. um but the village is quite well served as it happens for for amenities in in the village um but yeah in a, inevitably rural transport is absolutely terrible okay thank you joanne thank you jeff um okay Anne davis you had your hand up there what would you like to ask you're muted Anne. take your put your microphone on that's there. it thank you yes um i really love these schemes um, and I think we should be doing very very much more towards providing this sort of housing. Um, I'm interested in um, a few aspects of this. First of all, um, I'm a parish council member and I don't see why it isn't possible for parish councils to um, themselves manage and provide this sort of housing 
Um, I'd like to know if anyone else here is in that situation and, and how they've gone about it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, we have a round. Take that question. Let's take that question first, then. Oh, all right. Okay. okay. Sorry, I have a list of questions. It's, no, that's uh, okay. fine. That's yeah. fine. Let's take that first one. So, anyone with some experience of parish council matters, Tessa? Yeah. Well, um, the, there's a, she, a scheme in Shepherdsville in Kent near Dover, which um, is used in exception site. And they started from the parish council. Community land trust mm -hmm. would involve more people than just the parish council, which they have done, but it actually started with the parish council and they've put a planning application in. Were the parish, was the parish council a, a actively involved in promoting and delivering the scheme? Um, well, they started it off, so so yes, um, yes. But, but but as a community land trust would go out further than just the parish council, but right. the parish council are a good a vehicle to start it to start right. it, a CLT mm -hmm. off. Thank you. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, right. Se second question, which I think may have been answered, is we have a lot of um, very major sites allocated for housing, and we do not see this sort of scheme being brought forward, even on quite small areas of those major schemes. Um, they seem to be confined to small areas, small sites, some of which are not very regular, very awkward, uh, and where the getting a good layout is actually hampered by the scale and shape of the site. Whereas incorporation into the major sites would make certain aspects of the layout much easier. Um, is this purely down to the developers on these sites when outline permission is, is applied for, simply racking up their profits so much um, that this type of housing is can't be brought forward? Okay, who wants to take that one? Um, well, take this question, then I'm going to take a question from Andy, and then we're going to head into a short 10 minute break before we come back to the breakout rooms. So who wants to take that question from Anne about the um, developer side of things. Any takers? Oh no, oh. I could go for that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this is this is a really key issue, and it, it comes down to kind of um, I think part of the weakness that is there in how things like affordable housing is enforced, uh, and generally, just I think a lot of local authorities just resort to the big developers as a way to to meet their targets, and then you know developers gradually sort of try and ratchet down. Um, various elements of affordability, sustainability, uh, and everything else. So I think it, it, it is a matter of local authorities. Uh, if the government, the national government, won't lead on it, you know, allocating specific sites, specific quotas, and basically allowing community-led housing in the room in a way that they, I think that is, is gradually happening. And I think if you look at uh, the, you know, there's been a, we'll talk about later about the renewal of the community housing fund and also the affordable housing fund, which is the capital funding, that they are looking to basically give more money to community-led groups and, and sort of seeing this as a way of solving the housing crisis in a way that I don't think was before. And I think it, it's about forward thinking, local authorities catching on to that and really, um, you know, supporting the groups, which I think South Hams is now doing. I think, you know, should our schemes be successful, which I feel like they, they will be, they will look to this as a model now. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and really bring forward these schemes in a way that, you know, that they should be. So, yeah, I, I'm optimistic, actually, about that yeah. particular. OK, so, great. Thank you, Donal, and thank you, Anne, for your question. Um, I'm going to come to Andy Greenham now, and um, then we'll go into a short 10-minute break. Andy, you're muted. <laughs> Always forget to do that, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, my question's for Joanne, and it might might feed out to, to um, the the other project and and the architect as well. But I'm interested that you mentioned uh, that you had um, modern methods of construction um, and were were you know using structures built off site. So I had a a very sort of basic question about did you choose volumetric or did you choose something else, and then how you arrived at that decision. And just to sort of declare my interest in that. Um, because I'm also in in South Hams in Devon, um, that that our local authority, uh, South Hams District Council, has started its own wholly owned company and it is planning on building 5,000 affordable 
homes using these methods and my understanding is they're broadly looking at volumetric and I'm sort of really interested in actually how sustainable are volumetric methods of con construction when they're um, when they've come sort of off-site from a factory somewhere. It's really interesting what you say about South Southampton. I, I don't want to, we perhaps should chat about that offline in terms of, you know, it's boring for people in in, oh, yeah. in, in Kent. But um, this is really a question for uh, Donald about the, um, about the exact, exact methods. For us, we, we just, you know, very quickly threw away the idea of doing straw bale houses, which is actually where we where we sort of started uh, at the beginning. Um, it's raining now. It's you probably hear it beating on my roof, and uh, who wants to be out with straw bales and that? But um, Donald, um, do you want to say a little bit more about the exact nature of our panels and our our construction? Sure. Yeah, I think it's a really important point, and I think there is a sort of balance always to be struck between the bespoke and the kind of a, you know the, the reproducible and the mass producible, or what what's going to work at scale. Um, I don't know the details of the South Hams thing. I think it does. It's sort of two things it comes down for me. It's making sure that you are designing buildings that are actually responding to needs, ideally for the end user, rather than just generic you know, uh, reproducing things not, that are not necessarily tailored to a particular household or, you know, you end up making lots of modifications, changes, ripping things out. Uh, but also the sustainability of the materials by which those um, volumetric, you, you know, if you're talking about the same three bed house being produced over and over again, what are the walls made of, what are the insulation materials, what, you know, what the kind of, how are they reducing concrete, how are they reducing plastic? I think in principle there's nothing wrong with it necessarily but the worry is that you don't get I mean the process that we've gone through with the communities is that we've really designed to their needs and it's been a genuinely consult consultative process so you know we've changed what we're doing quite a lot by what um what the feedback from the, the events we ran and the community consultations which we used to get to do in person with tea and cake in the village hall which was better but, you know, so that's my concern. So I, don't, I think in principle, there's nothing wrong with it, provided you're not producing kind of mass housing estates and not responding to the community or the, the housing need, you know, uh, and also, yeah, what, what, what they're made of, really, what materials are being used. Because, you know, we've all seen from Grenfell Tower that, you know, the, a lot of these synthetic insulation products really shouldn't be going into buildings anymore, I think is, is generally my view. Mm, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Donal. Thank you, Angie, for your question. OK, we're going to take a 10 minute break now. Um, so let's say that we come back just a couple of minutes after 11 and um, we'll go into our breakout sessions. So go and get a cup of tea and we'll see you in 10. Sort of change over, the, over time, but we are looking to have houses that cost at least only two thirds of the market value, if maybe even a little bit under that, because the market value keeps keeps going up. So, so in that score, you're talking about two hundred thousand pounds for a three to four bedroom house, rather than the over three hundred thousand um, pounds to to buy such a house on on a similar size house or on 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 the open market. And to do that, you need to. Be mindful that every single thing you do in your scheme adds actual real money to the cost of the houses. So I could talk a little bit about the Section 106 costs, but I always think about it. Well, that's another two grand added to each house. And, and that, that's that's really important. I, I think sometimes um, people external to your scheme can actually lose sight of, uh, of that and that these costs just add money to people you know cost to people who really want to live in these houses so um so we have a pre-commencement budget or funding i should say of about one hundred and eight thousand, which seems like a lot of money and i don't think it's going to cost us that much but we've actually managed to raise that much um so that is incredibly useful uh we think the overall cost for our scheme is going to be about uh, 1.8 million. I think that um, uh, we may not need to um, take in as much funding of that as that for the development because we will have the 
sort of taking off costs as we go. So in other words, if we take pre-commencement costs off that, then we're, we're reducing the amount that actually we need uh, across the overall for, for the next phase, the development phase of the build. And uh, in our scheme, because our, our sort of self-build and self-finishes are buying parts of their houses, some equity share in their houses, of course, they, they will need to be able to get a mortgage. Uh, and that, that's really important to bear in mind. And I think it came up about the construction and the kind of construction methods you use. It's incredibly important that um, these houses are, are certifiable, as it were, and mortgageable. Otherwise, um, our homeowners will not, be able to, will not be able to take them on. Do you want to go to the next slide, Donald? Um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit more uh, about exactly where this money came from. So our pre-development uh, funding, we had a small grant from CL CLT Network. They had, I think it was called a technical assistance fund at the time. And this was about three and a half thousand. And it had, the, the group CLT had actually sort of secured that before I arrived, but this is where sort of governance started to, to, to come up right at the beginning when you're looking at um, raising funds in the sense that um, attached to that um, grant was a requirement that the CLT would be have governance uh, managed in a certain way. And that's where I was brought in because I was not going to be a beneficiary of the scheme. And I actually don't live in that village and therefore was deemed a sort of independent um, and that, that was one of the things they asked for. So that, that was a kind of start of where you realise that you're going to be asked a lot of questions about, about governance and, and, and how, you're, how you're managed. Um, and I think that due diligence on, on your organisation uh, increases and gets, gets more uh, detailed the more money you're going for, obviously, and also the further you get on with your journey. But the good part about that is the further you get on, the more you have had opportunities to um, demonstrate good governance and the more kind of experience you get and the more you've got an accounting um, uh, track record, you know, you'll have your accounts and all that because people want to see all, all of that. So um, we were also very fortunate. I think I talked a lot about how much we were actually supported by our district council part of that support was a grant a pre-development grant which i think which was twenty five thousand pounds we got from them as part of their uh, all of their efforts to support affordable housing in our in our district um and again you know this is where it, it gets really interesting because we then were able to get actually i think it came the other way but but we but often you're required to find match funding so so that's again a chicken and egg you've got to get one and before you can get the other um so you've got to kind of bring these things together so uh, i think it was south hams actually gave us the match funding but the original funding came from the homes and communities agency so so once we were uh, developing uh getting into pre-development we were able to secure a grant from from what's now Homes England but was then the Homes and Communities Agents I think that was about 18,000 or so um, and that had a lot of requirements around community engagement around reporting it was heavily milestoned it was paid in arrears um, which was not very helpful um, and I was had the opportunity to feed back to them about some of these sort of chicken and egg problems. But because we also then were able to get South Hampshire Council money as match, which had less strings attached, we could use that to cash as, as a kind of cash flow part and then also claim the money back. So all in all, it was quite a successful phase for us in terms of funding. And we spent all of that 48,000 on a lot of reports, Donald, you probably recall a lot of them. Um, and also things like planning fees. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so what else did, yeah, I can, I can probably bring up a list of all of, all of the things that we had to pay for. The, so one of the trickiest parts of funding is actually 
the land purchase itself. I think it has traditionally fallen between two stools. So it has um, not, people have not, who, who support pre-development funding don't want to fund the land purchase. And a lot of post uh, planning application funding, so funding that takes you into development, um, doesn't want to pay for it either. And, and actually owning the land becomes a precondition of that funding. So how are you supposed to um, get that funding if you can't own the land because you haven't got the money to buy the land? And again, we were incredibly fortunate, have been incredibly fortunate because we were able to um, talk to Southampton District Council about that prob that very particular problem, how this was a, um, a sort of chasm that we had to get over in order to move on with our scheme and and we have been granted that money and indeed we have that money sitting on our, our in our account to fund that land purchase and that is a grant it is um what i like to think of as free money so you can see we're doing pretty well at this stage because um so far it, it's all free money and and when it's free money that is taking off real the real cost of your houses that's actually making them a lot cheaper basically um uh so every, every bit of free money make, makes your house cheaper the then so the next bit of funding we which we have secured is uh funding from cafench which probably a lot of you will be aware of and they have um open funding schemes at the moment and here we were able to secure basically what's half a loan, what an amount that's half loan. So I think we've got 34,000, which is loan, um, which comes from Cath Venturesome, and 54,000 uh, from, uh, from a grant scheme, which is from another body. I'm just looking at my notes, I'll put up, but they manage both of them. And this is actually the loan part of this scheme is actually really expensive. So which is quite interesting because they charge an eight and a half percent interest rate on that loan. Well, you'll have noticed that interest rates are actually at 0.1 percent, I think, in the in the country, maybe about to go negative. Uh, and so that is really expensive money. However, it is money that bridges us to do all the work that will get us to where we can um, raise um, a development finance from the Ecology Business Society. So this and also it's it's cheaper when you look at the fact that we're also getting a matched money as a grant. So I look at it as going thinking about eight and a half percent across across a whole hundred. Um, uh, it's really half of that four and a half percent because it because half of it half of that hundred eight thousand is grant. If that makes sense. Um, the precondition on that money is actually owning the land. So you can see if we if we couldn't find a vehicle to own the land, we wouldn't get that money. Now I looked at Caf Venturesome and I'm going to bring up their web address in a minute on the next slide, but I think they're now lo also loaning on the land purchase. The other thing to look out for on these loans is that, and um, particularly that Caf Venturesome loan is that it has a um, non-utilization fee. So if we don't draw down all the money, we'll also have to uh, pay uh, pay uh, some two percent interest, I think, on money that we don't draw down at the final drawdown date. They have things like long stop dates, um, where if you haven't um, used the money, you have to send it back. There's there's there's, there's lots of mechanisms like that. It it is um, it is viewed as an investment. Um, by by Cath Venturesome, that, that loan aspect. But you can still see that we're doing really well. So if you look at how much money, as it were, you can tot up to that point um, uh, round here. Uh, we've only actually had to loan at this point 54,000. That I think that's pretty good going. So then our next phase will be um, raising the money for development. And um, we really will be looking for three, three, or three sort of friends here. here. Homes England, we can talk a bit, a bit more about this. I think it's quite important. Donald's going to talk about this as well. Have opened a new um, development fund for affordable and community housing. But they, 
they had one which closed last year and they've opened a very large new one which I think is, um, is really exciting. So we haven't done our application for that yet so I haven't really looked at how hard that's going to be but but it is there and but there are op but what I am aware of, again, is going to look very, very carefully at your, your track record, uh, about governance, about value for money, uh, all of those things. So that so we'll also be looking to probably will need it also in terms of value for money. I think they're not going to fund whole schemes because the idea is to actually get give you finance that you can't get from elsewhere. So it, it, from that point of view that that's part of their scoring so we'll still I think be looking for a development loan from the Ecology Building Society. Now the Ecology Building Society is absolutely brilliant if you haven't had any conversations with them they interest rate I think is around three to five and a half percent I think it depends very much on how sustainable your your scheme is so there's a scale for that um, but they do not like to lend on the whole cost of a scheme. And that's really common. They, they're happy to be the senior lender, but they don't want to be the only lender. So Vent Venturesome also have a development pot of funding and um, Ecology Building Society and Venturesome do work quite closely together. So I think it's quite likely that we'll end up a mix of, of all three. So. The Ecology Building Society will both lend to developers, I, in our case, us, the CLT, but they'll also lend to homeowners. So we as developers will we, we'll develop the homes with partially with the Ecology Building Society loan. And then it's quite likely that our, our home owners will, will take on mortgages to then buy portions of the home off, portions of their home offers, equity shares of the home offers. And it's, it's most likely the Ecology Building Society will do at least some of those mortgages. Next one, Donald, please. Um, so these are just, just the links here, really, uh, that you can see. You probably had a good look around around those. Um, Donald will say more as well. We've also benefited from um, uh, RCEF um, grant. That grant... Um, was to look at feasibility for our microgrid. So we've had about 10,000 from them so far to do the feasibility study for that, which is really useful. And we're looking to put in a new application to do more work towards that. Well, basically mm -hmm. to pretty much set it up, Donald. But I think the reason yeah. why I'm sort of, sorry. I was just, just to say, we've got only got 10 minutes left. Oh, sorry, so, uh, go on. It's all right, have you got, is, is that, is that, because I think what you've been giving is gold dust. Is that the most of it? Uh, yeah, I've done, done now. Sorry, folks. That's the way. So uh, I had two slides, but I'll make them ultra quick. I think it's important we have time for discussion. Um, so just this, this, this new funding that Joanne alluded to is this affordable homes program funding, which is grant funding to fund the capital costs. So that's the actual build costs uh, of affordable housing. Um, I think basically the idea here is traditionally social housing providers would obviously get a share of uh, their built costs funded by government for providing affordable housing. And I think the idea here is to broaden uh, the kind of range of types of applicants for this so that community-led housing groups can, can, can begin to sort of contribute towards this. Um, as I say, Joanne's looking at this, I think, as a route to funding um, part of their scheme. I, th I think obviously because they're for ownership, there will need to be some sort of kind of uh, qualification around some of their affordability requirements. Uh, so that's a very big fund. That's nearly it's seven billion pounds, trying to get about three hundred and thirty thousand homes funded over the next five years. So, you know, if any of you are looking at kind of affordability as part of what you're doing, I think it might be a really important way of making the numbers stack up for your uh, for your kind of build phase. Um, the other one, just, just as a summary, the Community Housing uh, Fund from Homes England, for a long time, as many as you may know, uh, well, it was funding a lot of community-led projects. It was cut towards the end of last, at some point last year, a year before even now. Uh, it's just been announced that's been renewed with 4 million, which isn't loads. The original, I think, amount was something like 56, but this is now a new sort 
sort of renewed route to funding that pre-development phase, which is the really hard bit, you know, where things are quite risky. Um, so we've obviously, Joanne and, and our other uh, guys at South Dartmoor have, have worked succeeded with that. So yeah, uh, we might be able to kind of help you on, on that process. So yeah, I think I'll stop there because everything else Joanne's already touched on, but you know, there are these sort of different funding routes for different stages of the project. So should we take some questions now, maybe for Joanne? Uh, uh, how are we doing this, guys? I don't know, we can see all your ha hands up. Do you want to stop sharing, Donald, and then yeah. we can see some hands. I don't know if we can see anyone. Who can we see with a hand up? Anyone with a hand up for, with a question for Joanne? Sophie. Oh. Yep. Hi, thanks. That's really interesting. Um, I was just wondering if, because um, you're accessing, it sounded like you're accessing the Homes England funding yourselves as the CLT. And are you having to partner with a housing association or another registered provider for any part so, of it? So, so my understanding, Sophie, is you can do it yourself now. So that's what the, the old model was that you, you had to do that. And um, but I, my understanding now is you can go through a qualification process to to be one yourself. So you have to go through a process, um, but you but you can now do that. So it makes it more accessible for small uh, one-off developments. And that's under the, it's split into two things. And one of them is called continuous market engagement. So it's that, it's that part of it, which is much more geared to sort of single developments rather than, you know, ongoing developers doing lots of schemes. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks, Joanne. Anyone else with a question? Graham. Uh, yeah, and no, I was just um, following on from that point, and it, it's probably fairly obvious, but um, I'm, I work for an RP, and we're partnering with a CLT, um, and yeah, it's quite an obvious thing, but you can only apply once. We, we've applied um, the HP program, um, so the CLT can't also get the money from, from that pot as well, um, that would jeopardise our bid, so it's just something to bear in mind, really. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's quite technical that bid. I think probably we needs a lot, a lot of thought. Yeah, lovely. Okay, thank you, Graham. I have a question here from Gabriella asking, what are the conditions regarding the beneficiaries of the scheme, i.e., the homeowners? Yeah, I mean, um, there there are homeowners. It's really it's they've they've been through the allocation process. So, which and against uh, a criteria that was decided uh, jointly between ourselves and Southampton District Council, the Planning Authority, but um, is fairly standard and is about local connections and so on. So, and then we, and also about obviously not ho owning a home already, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we, um, what we did because some of those people had. Some some people who wanted to put them, you know, an application forward to to build a home, had been members of the CLT and so on for a long time and helped to build it. But that in itself doesn't make you fit the allocation criteria. And so we actually um, use um, Right to Buy Southwest as the organisation to um, to qualify people, and that that was that worked very well. It was that was very very helpful. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Joanne. Janet, you have a question? Okay, so we are a group of people who are all 60 plus, and we are looking at doing a co-housing. So we're at a very early stage and we've just been talking amongst ourselves. We all of us own our own homes, but we would need to be able to cash flow how we would do our co-housing build. And we're sort of wondering whether we're eligible for any of the grants that, that are available to do to, to do some of the feasibility in the development. Could I, I don't know the answer that? to that question. And I, I'm really sorry. I don't know. I, I, Janet, I think and maybe I think certainly the community housing fund, which is the sort of if you like the revenue funding planning phase funding which has just reopened my concern is it's only four million and i think a lot of groups have been kind of waiting for this money to come back through i think you may be eligible there because it will be community-led housing and it doesn't necessarily have those same requirements that i think that 
capital funding will have on it being affordable housing, basically. So in theory, I think you could, your justifiable free development costs could definitely include feasibility work around the kind of economic, you know, viability of uh, yeah. what, you're to, what you're looking at doing. I don't want to, don't, don't kind of, uh, uh, you can quote me on that, but I, you know, I think it's worth investigating, but mm. I, that is my understanding, that it is there to fund all of the parts that you need to get you to, to planning, basically. Because we'd be looking at doing a mixture where some of us could afford it and some of us couldn't. And, uh, and you know, so it'd be a sort of mixed a mixed bag because some of us got money, some of us haven't. Yep. <clears throat> okay. All right. Thank you, Janet. Um, we have just under two minutes left in the breakout room. Is there another question before we finish in here? Anyone else? Graham. Just a, a quick question for Joanne, and, and really just out of interest, um, you mentioned the um, the cost of the plots. Um, you had, I think, two sort of open market plots on those on your scheme as well. Were they the same uh, cost at the same price, yes. or did you have an uplift yes. for those? You did right. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that was the nature of the village housing initiative deal. So so actually that 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 it wasn't really to do with my tough negotiating skills. That was really uh, sort of sort of a close to the cap that almost the district planning, you know, would would put on that, that transaction to allow the you know, planning commission even to be a starter, you know, to put you on the starting blocks really. But he gets a plot. The farm also gets gets a plot that he can he can build a house and sell a market value house. With, with yeah, so with the permission, he can then as yeah, a custom build plot or something. Um, yeah, he's yeah. taking part. Yeah, in our yeah. build actually. But yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Joanne. We are about twenty five seconds away from the breakout rooms counting down for one minute. So I don't know if there is any more. Um, useful information or points anyone wants to make before we before we well, close I, what I meant to say was I should have said I I found come across schemes where people get really overwhelmed by the by the end problem of the financing development and the cost of each screw for a house and everything don't even look at that just start at the beginning take it step by step mm -hmm. yeah yeah and just to say if you had more questions um I think, are we going to funnel them through you, Kirsty, initially? Yeah, if um, people want to keep adding questions, when we go back to the main session, just keep adding your questions into the um, into the chat. And certainly, yeah. I know the presenters are kind of keeping their eye on that, and I've seen answers being, um, being offered. But yeah, just keep adding them to the chat. After we finish the session, we will get answers to all of those and send them around in an email. Yeah. Just, yeah, I mean, we, you know, if, if you have got a project you're looking at, we as SDC would be really keen to kind of provide sort of free advice uh, um, where, you know, maybe we can draw on um, expertise we have in, in doing this in the past. And yeah, so do feel free to kind of make contact with us. That's great. Uh, Fab, thanks, yeah. Donal. We're closing out in about four seconds. So I will see you back in the main on, on things we've done in the past. So, so yeah. Um, this is uh, a, a figure we've taken from, from what was called the old Code for Sustainable Homes, which was actually scrapped in about 2015, uh, which was a government's attempt to kind of drive sustainability through the house building design and operation process. Um, it was well intentioned. I think it had its flaws and it, it, it often forced people down certain roads where maybe it was felt a bit like a box picking exercise, but I think it, covered quite a lot of the important issues and was trying to take a broad view uh, on what's important. We don't really have a replacement uh, scheme in place now. The regulations are much sort of more vague and often in many ways less uh, strict, although the carbon and CO2 part is, is again being kind of given a renewed focus through something called the Future Home Standard, which should take our homes to sort of zero carbon, new build homes, not until 2025, sadly, which we all think is much too late kind of mad that we're even thinking about building homes that are not fit for, for our kind of zero carbon future now and will have to be retrofitted later. So I'm mostly going to talk about new build. Um, we do do retrofit uh, work and some of you may be looking at that as an issue but um, 
I mostly concentrate on, on new builds for now. Um, so yeah, energy and CO2 emissions are obviously a really big thing that often springs to mind when people think about sustainability. It's not the only issue, but it is clearly a really important one. Uh, so our homes are responsible for about a third of our, our greenhouse gas emissions. So buildings are responsible for about a third of our greenhouse gas emissions. About 20% comes from our existing housing stock, so a really big amount. It's actually changed very little in recent years when we've seen sort of other areas of the economy start to decarbonize. Uh, most of that is coming from space heating and hot water. So how we heat our homes is really, really essential to, uh, to sort of tackling this issue and um, moving away from fossil fuel heating is kind of a, an essential route uh, to, to meeting net zero and, uh, you know, avoiding kind of dangerous climate change. So um, heat decarbonisation is a really big issue. So I think Jonathan actually already presented this slide, um, but we, we tend to advocate uh, for passive house principles, if not always going for passive house certification. So passive house really is, is an approach which advocates um, majorly reducing the energy demand. So sort of the first call of action is to try and uh, minimize the energy you need, need to heat and cool the space. Um, that can often result in bills which are 10 times less than a typical home. Um, uses things like heat recovery ventilation, um, actually also a big emphasis on shading and reducing overheating. Um, so yeah, well, I think it's important to mention there are other models available and we're not dogmatic about what approach people choose to go through. There are other ways, naturally vent ventilation, um, things like ground source heat pumps, which may work better in a slightly, sort of spending slightly less emphasis on improving the energy efficiency of the building fabric. But the point still stands, I think, um, you know, getting efficiency right is really central to, to any kind of uh, sustainable approach. What's going on here? Um, yeah, just to reiterate that point, so, you know, it's kind of an emphasis on the building fabric, um, Walls, roofs, and floors well insulated. Trying to reduce air leakages where possible. What's called air tightness. Many of you may know a lot, a lot of this already. I'm just sort of running through. Um, we often use mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, which is where you extract um, moist, stale air. You recover the heat and then you bring that back in through a heat exchanger for kind of fresh, continuous fresh air. And you actually see a really high kind of increase in, in uh, internal air quality, reduce CO2 and moisture. That helps with things like concentration, feeling tired, uh, and it's actually been shown to actually be really important in uh, COVID-19 trans transmission, interestingly, uh, the level of ventilation. Um, but there are other ways of ventilating a building, and it's not the only route, it's important to, to know. Um, so you can see here in our little figure, we've got insulation kind of wrapping around uh, the inside and outside of the building. That's something we kind of advocate on all design processes that you want to have as few what are called thermal bridges as possible to stop heat. Uh, leaking out or cold leaking in effectively. So low carbon heat, um, clearly fossil fuel boilers and oil boilers based on gas must increasingly be phased out. Um, this is a really big challenge at the moment and, and there aren't really as yet kind of one size fits all solutions. Each has to a degree a drawback uh, associated with it. So. Um, one key area that we advocate often is, is the use of heat pumps, either air or ground source, that's taking heat from the ambient air or, or soil and ramping them up uh, for use in heating in hot water. That does tend to require either bigger radiators or some kind of underfloor heating to operate because they operate at a lower temperature and they tend to run throughout the day for a longer period. So it's a, it's a sort of change in people's heating practices, which can be challenging, particularly if you're thinking about what people are used to. Uh, they're used to kind of turning on their heating system. Today. So there is a kind of behavior change associated with, with some of these technologies. Um, heat networks may also play a big role. They tend to be restricted to dense urban areas. You know, there are examples actually in Sussex of uh, the village of Thurl, is that right? Uh, trying to install a kind of community owned heat network. I think it's one of the only examples. Generally, tends to be in city centers, um, but you know, it, it is an important route. Obviously, the heat goes into the heat network, needs to be from the low carbon source we're caring about climate change. Um, another one people are often interested in is biomass. Um, I think particularly in rural areas, people like the idea of a wood burning fire, it's kind of a romantic thing. Um, I think that's fine provided that the biomass is coming from somewhere local or is sourced sustainably. Um, it does create issues in city centers with air pollution. And you've also got to ask, you know, if we're importing biomass from, from abroad, can we really be sure that that's a sustainable uh, source? You know, and is, is this a solution for the main street.
green, I think is an important question. Uh, other routes, things like solar thermal, which is, is good for hot water, that can only provide about 60% of your hot water demand. Um, obviously, on-site renewables are becoming increasingly important. So uh, we uh, generally, PV prices have come down sort of six or seven fold in the last decade, now increasingly cost competitive with or even cheaper than uh, grid electricity. So really, it's often a, almost a no-brainer now to install PV on your, on your project. Smaller, uh, so, so sort of slightly more um, marginal contributions. Occasionally, there are uh, waterways and watercourses that mean that micro hydro is viable. In some instances, um, tends to be rare, but if you do have existing streams and, and things like that, that can be a route. Um, also, micro wind uh, can be can be a solution. Does have kind of planning concerns, but again, in, in windy locations, can also be be, be a viable solution. Um, and also batteries are becoming increasingly important, particularly about sort of storing solar energy when it's generated and using, uh, using in the evenings, particularly as a sort of subsidies for solar become less generous. Um, yeah, so one interesting example we have in our, our harvesting scheme, which was Joanne's project, uh, and I think actually also Sophie, uh, their project in, in South Dartmoor is this idea of a microgrid. So here the idea is rather than when you're not using your solar energy, you just export it, sort of spill it onto the grid, we actually try and retain that generation on the site. So uh, in this instance, we have carports with solar panels on and provided anyone, so if number four wants to use the washing machine, you know that, that they can make better use of that kind of communally owned generation. Uh, and we use the Rural Community Energy Fund grant to look at the feasibility of this. Uh, and it looks to be quite feasible and actually will result in lower energy bills. It's gonna require us creating a small energy company to sell that energy to the residents sort of behind the meter effectively. Um, so that could be a really interesting, innovative approach. And I think the guys at Ivybridge are also uh, looking to do something similar at a slightly larger scale uh, with EVs in the mix as well. Um, obviously there was a question about water. Uh, water conservation is obviously really important. Um, there are simple things we can do here like low flush to toilets, low flow taps, um, but also things like rainwater harvesting um, can be a really good route. Can save about we, about 50% of the water we use gets flushed down the loo or used in the washing machine, and that doesn't need to be potable water. That can be rainwater. Various ways of doing this, either through direct feed from a tank or indeed feeding header tanks in the lofts, can be expensive. And I think the best way to go here is to have kind of aggregate one system and share it between multiple dwellings. Um, trying to do kind of one per individual dwelling, it can get very costly. Um, and I don't think the water companies are quite waking up yet. To, you know, offering kind of cost savings around this um, in many instances. Again, Jonathan stole my slide, but it's, a, it's an important point around um, materials here. So, you know, actually the, the, the things that we are making buildings from really matters. And this is kind of at the moment not really properly accounted for in, uh, in how certainly government and planning policy incentivizes uh, what materials we're using. We need to effectively move away from steel and concrete and towards natural materials. So you can see at the top right there, there's a, a hempcrete wall, uh, which in, uh, stores a lot of carbon into the, into the wall uh, through sequestration from plant-based material. There's also a cellulose block there, which is the insulation material that we use on a number of projects. There's also a really nice um, thatched extension that we did on Dartmoor a number of years ago, um, the timber frame. So as Jonathan showed you, you know, if, if we adopt natural-based materials, um, we can actually sequester carbon from the atmosphere into the building and also like the other kind of benefits from reduced use of chemicals and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So yeah, it's a really central thing. And I think it's something that's very important for people often is, is that kind of, you know, what, what, what their homes are gonna be made of and sort of feeds into things around, you know, your lived experience of living in the house too. So um, yeah, just a piece on, on, on runoff. So obviously, you know, um, uh, Trying to mitigate and, and reduce the amount of uh, rainwater that we put into the, the drainage system. There's various ways of doing this that also create uh, amenity value. So things like bioswales and, and rain gardens that can be a really nice feature, or ponds that can hold water as it's running off, create wildlife features, and so on and so forth. That can be a really added benefit. And if you're really radical thinking about comp potentially composting toilets, which don't require any water at all, a uh, bit of a divisive one. This not everybody wants one of these, but. Um, you know, they, they can actually be a really sustainable uh, way to 
because there's a suppose of human waste can actually create fertilizer, particularly if you've got um, food growing and stuff. So not for everyone, but you know some some groups see that as a really important thing. Um, yeah, just just to brush over, you know, we think that sort of taking a site uh, off-site approach it really helps reduce. And I've seen that the, the data on this it really helps reduce the amount of waste that's being produced, particularly from skips on site, and uh, it's just a much more efficient way of building. Uh, so you just have less waste in general. Um, and just causing less sort of damage and, and upset in the community that you're building in can be quite an important factor. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, so we sort of advocate that. Um, just around kind of pollution uh, and health and well-being. So I think, um, you know, we should be thinking about designing homes for lifetimes. So designing for as people age, making sure that the, uh, the layout is suitable for someone potentially with toilets on the ground floor or if people need to you know, live on on the ground floor, that allowing for that in what we're doing and designing. Um, the importance of disability access and making sure that homes are accessible, very important, I think, for all of those things. Food growing, other other things like that can really improve people's kind of quality of life and well-being in in, uh, in the homes that they live in. Um, sort of slightly separate issue, but things, you know, thinking about pollution and air quality so a lot of people do like wood burners but as i said in, in, in built up areas they can be quite uh, produce a lot of soot and, and, and actually contribute to uh, worsening air quality um so yeah all of these things are kind of kind of significant i think um my favorite topic probably is, is around ecology um and the sort of positive ecological impact that we can actually make by building housing that sounds contradictory but it doesn't have to be actually if we're putting homes and, and it, uh, but with you know uh, new vegetation and natural planting uh, wildlife and biodiversity features green roofs new hedgerows uh, we can actually enhance the ecological character of the places we're building particularly in rural areas particularly if it's it's a pasture field that you know maybe have sheep or cows on it you may actually see a net biodiversity gain um, and people can you know that can be people's surroundings that's a philosophy that i think we really uh, want to promote and, and kind of get out of this view that people, where people live has to be a kind of urbanised environment and actually trying to reconnect with, with the natural environment in the place we live. So that's something we really put rather as a kind of uh, afterthought, something we really think should be central to all good forms of development. So I think that's all I have to say. Um, just wanted to sort of ask the group kind of what does sustainability mean for you uh, in your context? What are some of your key objectives from a sustainability perspective in what you're uh, looking to do and maybe how might we be able to help at this stage uh, and feel free to drop me an email if you had um, any further questions or we can help in any way. So I'll stop sharing the screen and we can do Q&A or discussion. Yep, okay. Thanks Donald, who'd like to go, like to go first? Um, in responding to some of those questions that Donald posed at the end there about your own schemes. Richard, Richard Powell. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, an issue for us, this is the, the Tenterton TLC, um, is the changing demographics about... Community. Oh, you've frozen there, Richard. Sorry, we missed. A clear sustainability Sorry. is attracting outside yeah. house prices, and the houses that have been built are not the right sort of houses. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, you might uh, want to turn your video off. And then you um, broke up. Yeah. yeah, maybe turn and your off. video off, Richard, right. and just give us audio. Okay. Sorry, go again. Yeah, how's, how's that? Yeah. Um, saying that um, demographics in the town we're seeing as a sustainability issue because we're changing as a community getting our less families school population um, uh, declining so on and so forth so as a, a, a CAT looking particularly at uh, trying to provide affordable housing for the next generation coming okay through. all right you did. broke up a lot but i think i got to do, <laughs> to, to do what we did as families i.e to be the emerging population of, of the town of the next generation as well as the 
Okay, you're, you're breaking up there, um, Richard, really badly. I don't know if you can even hear us. In love, in jobs in the town. Uh, no. And I'm wondering if, if there is a body. How would you do it? Okay. You broke up quite a lot there, Richard. So I've put you back on mute there, but I think Donald got some of what you were saying. I think he's talking about changing demographics, the need to keep people in, in rural communities who would otherwise leave and kind of that challenge. I, I take it particularly around young people as well as, oh, maybe maybe both dimensions. Kind of, um, I think this is where, this is the point of community-led housing, isn't it? It's exactly this point. It is particularly in areas, and I think Kent shares many of these features that Devon has, uh, as well as Sussex where we also work. But, you know, houses are extremely expensive and young people are often forced away to London or the big cities primarily for economic reasons. And that is not good for communities because you're getting, you're not having a, a wide demographic in the community. So yeah, I just think, I think that whether it's houses for affordable rent or mixed houses for affordable ownership, I think the other thing is about trying to create economic opportunities with these developments. So we're looking at a, a scheme that's just going into pre-planning in, uh, in East Sussex around creating live work units. I mean, with, with COVID, I mean, it's happening, there is a sense that maybe going into the office is, is going to be less important. So how about, you know, creating workshops or working spaces or food growing opportunities and kind of opportunities for people to kind of live and work in, in these spaces and places. So um, I, think that's, I think that's exactly why we're all here, isn't it, really, is, is because we value all of that and we value community and creating communities really uh, so yeah i just i would agree with that um point basically yeah great Thank I, hope you. That, I hope that answered your question <laughs> slightly if not more. richard please type out your question and we'll get an exact answer for you okay who has jeff you've got your hand up there go ahead you're on mute. mute i found the unmute <laughs> um i'm very impressed by all this and I'm, i've learned quite a lot However, uh, and I like the community building stuff, I think that we've got to do that. However, um, nobody's really targeting the uh, inequity of the planning system. Um, you, you've got 500 quid's worth of um, agricultural land becomes, I was thinking Tenterton, it will become uh, two or 300,000 just by signing a chit saying you can build a house here. Well, we've got tons and tons of land. London's a bit crowded at, is it 45 people per hectare? But the rest of the southeast is 4.5 people per hectare. And uh, Kent will be somewhere near that. There's plenty of space in Kent. So why, why aren't we admitting that what, what's happening with the planning system is forcing the price of houses up enormously? You know, 500 quid's worth of land plus a... 10 grand starter kit from uh, home kit from Poland, you could easily, well, that's not easily, but you could envisage 200k, 20k starter homes. Now, it Can I just stop? Can yeah, I okay. just stop you there one yeah. second, Jeff? Because um, this session really is all about sustainability. So it's a really good question. Can okay, you well, the, stain, sustainability, the, the sustainability comes in. Um, uh, uh, sorry, someone mentioned house prices. Um, the sustainability <laughs> comes in because, um, as I put in the chat, the House of Commons uh, Science and Technology Committee said, if you have mass car ownership, you can't have decarbonisation. This is even true of electric cars if you do the sums, and I've done a few of them. So... Can't, uh, having passive house standards and cars just doesn't mean we're sustainable. Okay, it's a good point that you make there. Who would like to take up that one there? Any comment? Uh, I see Anne yes. has a... Yes. Sorry. Yes. Go on, Sophie. Um, sorry, did you want me or Anne to speak? Oh, sorry, Sophie, are you going yeah. um, to come back um, uh, to Jeff's comment there? Yeah, so, um, so we, ha yeah, the reason we've got, 
ideally we'd like everybody on our housing site we've got 30 homes to not have their own car that's the that's our, our vision and we know that that's not feasible at the moment we can't get we can't force people to move into a house and give up their cars so we want to make it a bit easier for people to start thinking about giving up their cars by providing a small car club uh, which means that they yeah can avoid buying cars but also just by talking about transport as well we're kind of bringing that kind of agenda and conversation to people as well in a because we can't just force people to to do things unfortunately the electric bikes as well so we know that we need to get people out of the cars so we've got well, electric bikes if you're well. giving people very very cheap housing why can't you say if you move into this cheap housing, you can't have a car or there's no space for your car or parking it will be very expensive? Because those people won't then be able to drive to their jobs. Um, yeah. I, I, think, I think Conal uh, was developing a lot of local jobs, which is what we ought to do. And some of these sites are right next to railway stations. Yeah. Is it also true that if that is what the um, CLT wants, they can certainly um, put that in as, as part of their plan. And then it's whether they get support on that basis. Would, would yeah. that be true? The authority will usually force you down having car parking. Um, that's the thing. I mean, it's an, I think there's an important point here. And I think, I think you're both right. I think looking at Sophie's, the context, Devon, public transport is shocking in Devon. It really is. And it's because it's so rural, but there is, there is not, you could not have a viable livelihood as it stands in the current economy without sort of private transport. Mm. So, but absolutely, and you know, we need to be trying to get people away from cars as much as we can, reducing, I mean, I don't own a car. I use electric zip cars when I can, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to go that way. Generally, I set the train before all this crisis happened. You know, I, I'm just traveling a lot less now, but yeah, it, it, it has to be both sides. I think. The risk of cars are going to be with us one way or another, I think, for a while. And it, electrification is an important but incomplete part of that mm. decarbonisation journey. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Cycling, walking, local working, working from home, we all have a part to play. Yeah. What about micro transport? You know, um, ele ele electric um, uh, rickshaws. There's one in Totnes, isn't there, Sophie? <laughs> yeah, there is. All, all right, I'll shut up now. <laughs> thank you. Uh, that's a good point. Okay, let's, thanks, Donald. Thank you, Gev. Let's bring Anne in. Do you have a question to ask, Anne? Um, yeah, th this is where um, Jeff's comments about land prices is actually very key to the sustainability issue um, because the way um, I've seen viability studies done recently actually sets the land value as a fixed cost at an extortionate rate. Um, and the net result is that the surplus profit is converted to affordable housing. And of course, the developers make sure that that surplus is as small as possible so profits can be ramped up. And what the local plans need to do is to make sure that land near to uh, city and town centres is available through allocations in the local plan, which will help to control land prices, or we will forever be having these supposedly sustainable schemes um, flung out into the countryside where public transport is poor, where local amenities in terms of schools, shops, employment opportunities, community opportunities are at their lowest. And so we have the people most in need of all that support put into the very places where that support doesn't exist. And this is actually a key function of land price. And I think <coughs> if we want to make life sustainable for people on lower incomes or poor mobility or whatever, we really need to tackle this issue of land price for land close to the facilities, the transport that they need. Okay. So it's not a question. I was just backing up Jeff's comments on land price and saying, 
actually it is really key to the issue of sustainability. Okay. This is social spin. This is not the build sustainability. Uh, Donald said that, you know, social sustainability is an objective thing. Well, I don't think it is. We've um, got about 40 I, seconds left, Anne, okay, before I'll the stop room there. closes out. So but, let someone else come yeah. in on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, about a minute and a half, including the countdown on the timer. Do we have any comments from anyone or any I questions? should come back on a point yeah. unless someone else wants to. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I think social sustainability is also, well, it's subjective in the sense it means different things to different people. I think the, there's a very good book called Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing by a guy called Josh Ryan Collins, who talks about this issue of land value prices. One of the solutions he proposes is a, is a land value tax, so that actually where there is a big rise in, in net gain, that, that local authorities and public sector can capture some of that. The other is compulsory purchase, perhaps, for certain sites and reallocation to affordable. Yeah, demarketizing land is, is massively important. So I, I really agree with that. Just we can't solve everything as little community housing actors. You know, we can push, push policy for these areas, but some of them are very um, well, riven into the nature of capitalism, really, <laughs> to be honest. So it's, it's a hard fight. It's an important yeah. one, but it's a hard one. Definitely, it is. But um, certainly people like SDC are doing their bit. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd really encourage everyone to, to have a look at all the websites from all the speakers today because they have got such a fabulous amount of really valuable information in them. So we'll put those in the chat when we go back to the main room in about five seconds. Thanks. I did. I'm learning as much about how to operate Zoom as I am about sustainable housing, or probably I mean, <laughs> perhaps not quite as much. But um, yeah, uh, it's a nice option to be able to choose your room, isn't it? So um, mm -hmm. yeah, and it gives everyone. And this is quite a small group actually, so the other group is probably quite big. <laughs> so it will give everyone a chance to um, have a chat. Oh, I have to record it. Put record on. If everyone's okay with being recorded, uh, we're just doing that so we can compile the whole of the webinar um, and then put it up for everyone to view afterwards if they couldn't make it. Um, well, there's not that many of us. Shall we go around and just quickly say who we are and where we're, where we're from? And then I'll run through uh, a quick um, overview, really, of what the planning process has been on the Springfield Orchard site in particular, because that's a fairly large scheme. And... Uh, from a planning perspective was quite complicated. There was lots of hoops that we had to jump through. I do apologize in advance. My presentation is basically gonna be quite dry. I'm gonna run through the um, design and access statement, which is a document you prepare to accompany a planning application, uh, which gives an overview of all of the different aspects that you've considered in the design of the scheme um, and uh, sort of references, reports and things is a kind of reference document. We'll just go around. Um, I'm Jonathan from um, Sustainable Design Collective um, and I've been working um, on the Springfield Orchard site predominantly for the last kind of uh, eight months or so. Uh, we submitted it for planning at the end of last year so we're currently negotiating with the planning officers about various aspects which I'll talk about in a second. Hannah do you want to say quickly who you are and we'll just quickly Yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm Hannah. Um, I work as a Catalyst Business Support Executive at Sussex Innovation, um, whereby I work with Sustainable Design Collective um, a few times a week. So um, my work isn't necessarily concerning CLT, so I'm learning plenty this morning. It's very exciting. <coughs> um, Tassa, did you want to... Oh, actually, we all... Yeah, yeah, so, if you name the, next, name the next person, <laughs> okay. Tessa, if you then name the next person, yeah, we'll sure. through everyone. Yeah. So I'm Tessa O'Sullivan, I manage the Kent Community Housing Hub and also the Rural Housing Enabling Service in Kent. Um, so, um, yeah, so, yeah, this is one of the events we're running. It's, it's really good, I think, to talk about this subject. So, and there's obviously a lot of interest in it. So the next person is uh, Jim, or James Booch, I should say, formally. 
Um, hi, hi everyone. So I'm Jim. Uh, I'm a community planner, a freelance community planner based just in, across the border in Sussex and I work with a lot of neighbourhood plan groups as well as big local groups in Kent and Sussex. Oh, um, so Anne. You have to take yourself off mute, Anne. Sorry, I should have said that. There we go. Um, I'm a member of Sturry Parish Council in Kent. Uh, before I retired, I was a chartered landscape architect with additional qualifications in urban design and also worked as a manager of public open space and, um, uh, and a certain amount of management of streets and, and roads. So I'm coming from this very much um, from a design perspective. Um, I am probably the person who would raise objections to schemes if I thought from those perspectives they weren't up to scratch. So I'm particularly interested here to see if we can remove those things to which I would object, even though I would be very much in favour of the scheme from every other point of view. Okay, great. Thanks. We look forward to talking about that. Uh, I'll, I'll just quickly, can we, because a few more people have joined now actually, so I'm worried that we'll run out of time if we spend too long on this, but I'll just quickly run through, uh, we've got BJS, do you want to say hello? And where are you from? Morning, uh, Elam Parish Council, Kent. Great, great. Jeff Beacon? Uh, Pollution Tax Association, I suppose I'm a, I've been a activist in housing, planning and environment since about 1970. Amazing. Great. Uh, Angela Vincent. Uh, hi, um, I'm here from uh, Kent Co-Housing, Co-Housing Group in Kent. And we've got Angie Greenham. Yeah, hi there. I'm um, joining from South Devon and um, just uh, slightly cheekily very interested in in what's you know what what brilliant projects are going on in South Devon and working with um, a local um, ecological design con consultancy that works with community groups so I've got a, a really I guess my primary interest in is in how communities can be empowered to do more community-led housing. H, H is iPad. Uh, hi, that's me. I'm here as a private individual on behalf of a group of friends who have often talked for years about what we call the old people's commune, where we would love to do a self-built project for people over 60 in a sustainable manner. So I'm no expert, nothing further to really contribute apart from just cherry picking good ideas. Yeah, there's lots of people here to... Um to ask or to, to sort of get in touch with and follow up with, I'm sure. Uh, you've all moved around. Simon Corby next. Screen saw. <laughs> moved around. Makes my job quite difficult. You're on mute, Simon. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Right. That, Good morning. Uh, chestnut. Uh, I've been involved in supervising or uh, the steering group for the rural housing enablers in Kent for about 20 years. I used to be chairman of a large housing association in London, um, but uh, I'm, we've always rather not expected to do a lot of community-led housing in our part of the world because land values are so high. Mm. But um, so we hope with Tessa's help to um, get, get some more on the road than we've got at the moment. Here in Faversham, where I live now, um, there is a community land trust in formation which is hoping to do some um, affordable housing in a non-rural context. Great. Yeah, the land value is definitely one of the biggest barriers, isn't it? Um, I don't know if that was Simon, is there another Simon? Simon Corby. Yeah, morning everybody. So, um, so I work for the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products. So we're uh, a not-for-profit organization looking at sustainable materials. Um, so I'm just, this is my first sort of look at um, community land trusts. So I'm just more interested in networking with everybody here and sort of working out what we can do in Deal and Dover, uh, which is where I'm sort of based. Great. Um, so we've just got John Cowell. Uh, 
Hi, hi. I'm John Carroll, and um, I work with um, Tintison Community Land Trust in, in Kent. Um, my job is um, I'm a consultant to designers and uh, contractors in London, Kent, and Sussex. Great. And um, last couple, Peter Wenham. Unmute, Peter. You should go on mute again now. Oh, oh, can you hear me now? Oh, no. Hang on a minute. Come back. We can hear you now, Peter. Oh, we, we could hear you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're on mute again. On mute now. Can you oh, hear me now? Now you're back. Yep. Quick. Quick touch. Sorry, I'm, I'm from Surrey as well, but um, I'm here to view to see, um, I don't know too much about the planning. We've done some, but we don't get enough planning uh, instructions uh, for some of the councillors that have not been here very long, you know. Anyway, I'm, I want to just view everyone and see what they say. But if you want to ask me any uh, questions about coming, I can help you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. God bless. I think you're on mute now, Jonathan. Um, Adam hasn't um, introduced himself. So. Yeah, Adam, and then uh, raise me, I think, and then I'll have to crack on. Hi, um, I'm working on a co-housing group here in Thanet in Kent, uh, and we're currently looking for land and putting our plans in action. Uh, and I was interested in planning because many of the remaining uh, sites here in the region uh, have some kinds of constrictions on them unfortunately. And then uh, Rosemary. I'm Rosemary Diamond, I'm parish councillor for the small village of Cobham in Kent and I'm here out of sheer interest and fascination because I'm sure it's something that's going to spread even though the land is very expensive in Kent. Yeah, yeah, um, it's that's I think the main barrier isn't it and I suppose Planning comes after that, really, but certainly when you're looking at a site and the, the value of the land is, is in a way proportionate to what can be built on it, um, as well as its location and whatnot. But um, I think it was mentioned in the previous session that, that, that a lot of these sites that we're working on have been a rural exception sites where, where development would not genuinely generally be uh, permitted. And, 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 but being a rural exception site, there's uh, a requirement for it to be um, almost all affordable housing or all social rent housing, but to varying degrees, depending on the local authority's requirements. And also with that come some additional planning um, requirements uh, to do with landscape character, you know, development in a rural location, even if it is kind of on the, on the edge of the settlement. And, um, and often these, um, rural exception sites will be in, in, in parishes or uh, in areas which are um, um, with, which have local plans which are more geared towards rural areas you know so it'd be hamlets or farmstead type um, um, properties uh, or, or, or settlements there so I'll just quickly I've got a, a presentation which is, is basically me running through the design access statement as I said for the Ivy Bridge project. And the reason I think that's worth going through that is predominantly because it covers a, a range of issues that you may come up against with a community-led project. Not the most interesting um, visually, so apologies. I will rattle through it quickly so then we can get on to having a bit of a chat. Um, this document I prepared at the end of last year, so it's, it's quite current in terms of the planning policy um, and it, it, it will run through um, the various kind of reports and things that you would need to get towards the end of the document. Um, I won't go into the introduction. Interru introduction of the client, we've heard from STCE, their main objectives here really to, to do something for the community, uh, which is also beneficial for the environment uh, with health and well-being really at the centre of their vision. It was important to mention that to the planners uh, 
even though it's not necessarily planning consideration. I think it forms part of the narrative about the, the, um, the scheme and, and why it's beneficial to the local community. We didn't mention it much in the last session, but uh, projects, as well as providing housing, there's, this, there's a community hub with a big hall. Um, there's also an idea of providing a shop on the site and, um, and for that, as well as the car club, to be um, available to the uh, wider use of the local community. I think you can see my mouse when I'm doing this. Are you seeing my screen share? We I can got, see, I see your statement. I just got the statement. Oh. I'll just stop that and start again because it's paused. Go. So this is the site. Hopefully that's coming up now. Yes, Ivy. yes, that's okay. As I mentioned, this is a rural exception site. It's outside of the, the town boundaries of Ivybridge, which is, is here roughly. Um, Interestingly, in this case, there's a railway station very close to the site. Can you make and it a bit bigger? I can, yeah. I can zoom Thank in. you. Sorry. That's okay. I should get some glasses. <clears throat> it's quite difficult with... Um, something yeah, it is. It's not as easy. There you go. Is that better? That's better. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so it's outside of the village, the, the town boundary. Yeah, uh, from a planning perspective, it's actually associated to a smaller uh, village called Ugbra, which is to the south east okay. of this site. Um, which, from a planning policy perspective, was important. But actually, a few of these fields around the site are earmarked for development in the local plan. Mm. Uh, if, if you know the area, which I think one or two of us do here, there's a large development happening over here called um, Law, what was it called? Law Homes or something. Um, so I've forgotten the name of it. But, and this, this site here is also being developed. So although this is a currently a rural area, it was important for us to stress that in the future, there's actually, the town is growing in this direction. And this may be the case for the sites that you're considering. Um, the, the, char the, the character of the area was, is changing to suburban. And actually the site and the way we're trying to design the site is to sort of have a, a, a rural feel or at least a very green feel to it such that it, it fits well into its current context and when in the future this whole area is probably suburban with you know your standard kind of housing developments it will stand out as being a bit of a um, representative of the fact that this area did used to be green or more green. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, we've, we were in these various parishes and wards, and, and so it's important to look at the local plans for these areas. For, for those of you who are looking at sites, get onto the um, local planning authorities' websites, find out what, what parishes and wards your site is within, and certainly if it's within national parks or um, um, conservation areas, find out what the local plans are and what the uh, requirements are around those sites, because there may be things in there that are kind of make or break. From a very early stage, you might, you might be able to sort of get a feel for whether or not a development of homes or whatever it is, is, is possible on the site. This is a lovely view of the, uh, the current site. It was, a, it was actually a nursery and is currently redundant. A lot of greenery on the site is actually um, kind of unmanaged and, and uh, in a way good but the, the, there's a tree survey which I'll come on to later uh, he was of the opinion that there wasn't much foliage on the site which was really worth preserving and so we've looked to uh, add in more kind of in terms of biodiversity but you can see all the way to the, the sea and as Sophie mentioned it's a lovely really fantastic location for housing. Um, okay pre-application advice uh, it's worth going for pre-application advice, probably always in every case, because that will help you um, once you've got a rough idea of the scheme, once you've kind of got some boxes on the site and you know how many homes you want to create, what the main parameters are in terms of um, transport and whatnot. If you, you can submit that as a pre-application um, to the local authority and they should hopefully be quite encouraging of this type of project. We were quite lucky, our 
planning officer was was um, we had an initial meeting with them and this was on Zoom because it was already uh, locked down by then. But um, we explained the, and I think it was good, the meeting, because we explained the importance of the project from a kind of social and community perspective. And then they were very much more supportive than they would have been if, um, if it had just been a kind of standard development. Anyway, the, the good thing about getting pre-application advice is it will, it will highlight to you all of the things you need to look into in much more detail for the full planning application. So in our case, there's a big issue around drainage and highways that we, we required a lot of surveys for, which I'll come on to. They also asked us to do a housing needs assessment to prove that in the local area, there was a requirement for further affordable homes. So we had to do quite a lot of research into A, the housing register, and then B, um, actually carrying out surveys in the local area to um, find out how many people um, were in housing need, essentially. Uh, we compiled a separate report that we submitted with the planning application that demonstrated that actually, um, although um, in theory the affordable housing need was being met in Ivy Bridge through the, the large developments I mentioned, new, new affordable houses being built, uh, in some cases, they weren't genuinely affordable. Um, and in actual fact, there was a shortfall. So, you know, we had to look into that in quite a lot of detail. They said at face value, we are, you know, we have got enough affordable homes being built. Everyone knows that that's not really true, but we had to really kind of get into that and, and find out if it was true and, and demonstrate in a report. And Bill, who should be here with me now, but unfortunately he's a bit unwell. Uh, could have talked a bit more about that because he 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 used to be a housing um, office. Uh, he used to be a housing director in, in a local authority, uh, so he knew kind of the uh, things to look look for there really and how to present that case. We also carried out a community consultation, um, and I'll talk a bit more about the design process in the in the following um, breakout room um, because although our client wasn't a community led group. Um, in itself, it's not designing these homes for the people within the group to live in. They are designing the homes for the local community. And so we did a lot of extensive community consultation about the scheme, in particular, what kind of shared facilities we were looking at having and uh, sustainability features. I mean, water harvesting came up a lot as a, as a, uh, a, as a thing that people would like to see. Um, and play areas, a barbecue area was something people mentioned, or a fire pit. Hot desk areas of work space is very important. We included some of those within the site, so we're not you know, necessarily encouraging people to travel. They can hopefully, some people at least, work on the site. I mean, that's all being blown apart by the uh, events of the last year, and I think a lot less people will be traveling for work anyway, uh, maybe working from home. And other things uh, that were quite high up on the priorities list. But one was an orchard, um, which is lovely because the site was formerly an orchard. So we wanted to try and include some kind of communal growing or allotment space. It, it all forms the planning narrative. I suppose that's why I've included it in this presentation. It's, it's part of the story of why the scheme's different and why, you know, although it's on a site which wouldn't conventionally be given approval, why it's special, why it should be considered. Um, there's a section on design in the design and access statement, which it talks about the overall design. I won't go into this too much now because the design is a specific um, element of each project. And, uh, you know, we could talk about the design for a long time and how it is, how it is. Uh, one element of the design, which is worth mentioning, accessibility. This is a sloping quite a steeply sloping site. I think it's around uh, 10 degrees. And um, we had to consider wheelchair access to the whole of the site, really. Um, and certainly accessible dwellings, which were able to access some of the communal facilities. Um, again, you know, uh, I think somebody mentioned it earlier, a lot of these sites that come up for community-led developments tend to be... Um, um, difficult sites in shape or form or sloping or whatever it is um, and these sort of considerations are very important because if you can't provide for uh, accessibility 
you know, and there's a requirement at, at the planning stage for some kind of accessible housing, then you, you will have a problem. Um, so you need to think about how that can be incorporated. Of course, there are things you can do with landscaping. The parking, we have, we do have dedicated parking for the accessible dwellings so that they have their own space. It's right next to their home. Um, and we've got one and two beds accessible dwellings. Yeah, so that was an important planning consideration. Materiality of the scheme um, relates somewhat to the landscape character and the area, the character of the area. In Devon, in this area, there's quite a lot of rendered buildings, uh, less timber frame, but the timber frame complements quite well the rendered effect. Um, we're not going for a traditional style of building. We're going for something which is basically quite practical uh, from a building perspective from a construction perspective and, and meeting the requirements of the client. But it's, it's important to mention the materials uh, planning conditions will stipulate probably that you send in material samples. It's quite straightforward, so I won't go into that too much. Um, I won't mention too much about the master plan of the site other than what's important for planning. Uh, I hope you can see this, it's a bit of a big, it's a big site and there's a lot going on. Uh, so I'll just look at this bottom area. The entrance, which I'll mention is transport. Uh, we had to get a transport consultant to help with the design of the entrance, and I'll come on to that. Uh, the, the parking, I'll mention what's an unusual features here, because these are things that you might want to include in your scheme, which may be contentious from a planning perspective, certainly from a traditional planning officer's perspective. We've got parking, which is not necessarily related to the dwellings. There's um, shared facilities and shared outdoor spaces plenty all throughout the site, which will require a maintenance strategy, probably at the planning condition stage, which um, is essentially if the scheme is granted planning, but there are aspects that the planners, uh, the planning officer feels need further consideration. They can attach conditions to the approval, such as pre-commencement conditions, one of which might be more detail into the landscape scheme and a maintenance strategy to make sure that these areas don't become redundant or unloved or uh, um, or sort of just wasted space. The client has considered that and, and uh, there is an idea to have a, uh, a kind of caretaker living on the site. Obviously they need to build a cost plan to, to include for that. Less, less controversial, the shared bins and bike stores. Um, that's, that's, you know, something that everyone would need to consider really. And at the center of the site is the orchard. Um, just a nice feature, the site also has, has a well on it, which is currently hidden in foliage, but uh, we've got this, the Springfield Orchard name really rings true on this site. So again, that's part of the narrative. Um, in terms of the drainage, this is something which is slightly, um, different perhaps to the conventional development is that we were using some ponds to help with the surface water runoff. And that required quite a lot of consideration from the drainage designer. Um, it's quite likely that the planning officer will query that. So we have to really reinforce all of these things with specialist advice. I won't talk about the sustainability strategy. Donald, I think mentioned talking about that in another session. Uh, which you could probably watch after this if it's I think it's happening now actually that one or maybe it's after this one uh, we're, we're going for low energy I think we've covered the, the broad range of things there's lots of PV and South Dartmoor Community Energy being an energy provider managing that with the kind of um, hopefully one payment system for the tenants that they have their rent from their energy bills and even potentially their, their uh, transport needs met in one in one cost uh, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with passive house design. We did run a passive house planning package uh, review of the scheme to make sure that we were hitting those targets. This wasn't a requirement for planning for us. Sometimes you are required to carry out a SAP assessment or some sort of more detailed energy strategy, but in the local authority in South Hams, it wasn't required. Um, but I'm sure with all of your schemes, you probably are concerned about sustainability and energy efficiency. So it shouldn't be a problem for you to achieve the local authority requirements. You just will need to consider getting specialist input probably to compile a report to satisfy those requirements. Okay, now the basically the rest of this document talks 
about the different consultants we needed to engage. And just for those of you who have got projects in the pipeline, these sort of worth jotting down, it's a lot of work to kind of approach consultants, get quotes, uh, especially if you're being, you know, your funding requires you to demonstrate the whole process of um, the project and, and who, where you're spending money. What's happened? Have we run out of time? 55 seconds. Okay, you need a transport yeah. assessment. <laughs> you need a landscape consultant, probably. You need a tree, tree surveyor uh, and an ecologist. It's very important. So the ecology of a site, uh, in this site, we've got um, some rare species of bats at the top hedge. So we had to consider how we would cater for them. Generally, we didn't have too many other species of note, but it's definitely worth engaging an ecologist as soon as possible on a site once you've got that kind of lined up. A drainage consultant I've mentioned is very important. Acoustic assessment is a standard sort of thing that you would need to uh, have carried out. I'm not going to have time to talk about planning policy, but it's definitely worth you looking into the planning policy in your local area. I'm sorry I've run out of time. I think we're going to get back to the main room now, but uh, hopefully that's given you a bit. Hello. If there are any planning specific inquiries, uh, especially with regards to specific sites or anything, do please get in touch because we'll be happy to kind of try and help. Um, wait a minute just to see if there's anyone else going to join it's going to be a very different type of presentation hopefully a lot more interesting <laughs> uh visual certainly more visual and um, i'm basically going to try and run through a few different examples of community-led housing projects not all by us uh, i should add uh i have to credit other architects designers and clients and various bodies of people where they are uh, where they are responsible for the work and the images and I'll send out um, a list of references after this. Um, yeah, I'm going to go through a few examples of different community-led housing projects, some you may be familiar with, some you may not, and uh, feel free to chip in at any point in this presentation if you have any information further about any of the schemes or if you're interested in anything in particular about any of the schemes, just jump in. Uh, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Um, I'm mainly going to be talking about how they've approached design and how so there's less less about kind of design you know what we do as designers because you know that's that's a sort of discussion about getting a site looking what could work and the different parameters some of which we discussed in the planning meeting it's more about how you can approach design as a community-led group so I think I'll start I'll share my presentation Is every, yes, I think you should all be seeing that, shouldn't we? I'll do this full screen so it's be easier. Is everyone seeing that's a full screen image? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wait one second, sorry. It's gone again. Yeah, should be there now. It was, uh, it paused itself. Okay. So, I've just raise your hands and put your hand up sort of on the screen. Don't have to do the little hand raise button. Have any of you familiar with this scheme? It's in Lewisham by Walter Siegel. Yes. Walter Way. Yeah, I'm sure you all are. Yeah, fantastic scheme uh, built in around the 70s. Um, and I suppose, you know, Walter Siegel's in many ways the father of the modern community-led housing movement, although I'm not sure if he would have kind of viewed himself as that at the beginning, he was more about just empowering people to build their own homes. And in addition, really providing a high quality of architecture. There are a few different Walter Siegel projects around. There's one in Brighton, where I am, I think. Um, and there's, there's a few in London. Um, what's, what I wanted to mention here is that the community really pitch in to both the design and the builds wholeheartedly. And uh, there's a project I'll mention at the end of this presentation called Russ. Uh, rural and urban synthesis society it's also in lewisham where they are embodying those principles um but on a larger scale to also sort of provide affordable housing for those people who might not necessarily have the capacity to actively get involved in managing and building the project like this so 
this really sets the tone, I think, for me anyway, in terms of what we're trying to do with community-led housing. Anyone been there or visited any of his projects? Yeah? Any comments or anything in the design or anything you like? No, I haven't, uh, I haven't visited the projects, but what I loved about the Walter Siegel concept is that you can adapt your home as you grow or shrink. Mm -hmm. So the walls yeah. were movable, you know, yeah. so it, it's, it's just the most fantastic adaptable living environment you can imagine. Absolutely. Oh. I have been there and I, I've got a friend who lives in one of the houses and I attended also the, the first Russ, um, uh, the, the meeting that was to set up Russ, which is the development yeah. organization that came out of that. And yeah, yeah. Probably. Lovely. Yeah, the, the adaptability thing as well. Yeah, it's really important um, for the longevity of people living at the site and, and you know, staying yeah. there and forming a community. We haven't talked about that much, but, you know, community takes time to sort of grow and gel. And doing this process, designing and building it together is, is a big part of that, but it can also be quite stressful. The joy is living there, isn't it? And living there for a long time, hopefully, growing, putting down roots. So yeah, these buildings, they're timber frame. They're built in such a way that the, the spanning structure goes from external wall to external wall, thereby allowing you to move internal walls at ease, really, and to build it how you please in terms of the internal layout. On the outside, they're all of the generally the same form and size, more or less. I should mention, this is the presentation I had to do as part of one of my exams. And uh, I was talking a bit about how Europeans are doing a lot better at self-build. I mentioned it now, but I'm really looking at this presentation. In um, this top right-hand image uh, is a place called Vauban, in Germany. It's not all self-build, but it has a very large self-build component. And there's a whole part of a massive area of a town, which is very, very low energy. Uh, in every respect, in terms of transports, um, food growing, uh, employment opportunities. It's quite a high density scheme. Not so much as this one here, which is in the uh, Netherlands, if you could probably tell by the image. Here, this is a different type of approach where it was very much a developer-led project, but people had the ability to self-build. So this is something which is not, unfortunately, as uh, common in the UK, although hopefully in the future we'll see more of this kind of thing. Uh, whereby you may not be in a community group, but you might want to build your own home. And this kind of development gives you the opportunity. Uh, Self-build community building is very popular in Austria with it um, providing 80% of the housing stock. This is an example I really like because uh, one of my friends was involved in this in the early stage with somebody I used to work with when I was doing carpentry work. Uh, it's called Ashley Vale. Bristol, don't know if any of you are familiar with this one. Uh, it's a nice scheme because it does both um, supported housing. These, these single storey dwellings here were built by the community, but for people who were in housing need or needed to live in supported housing. It also provides quite large uh, opportunity for people to build detached or semi-detached dwellings to sort of their own style or tastes. <laughs> And they've developed that the design process together took a long time. They've also got some flats and um, commercial sort of office space for co-working. The design process for this was very um, fluid, I believe, um, with you know models, people getting around the table. And this is the kind of thing I hope you all are doing or want to do or can hopefully have the opportunities to do once you're a bit further along, you've got a site that you've maybe got in mind and, and things are moving in terms of the finance. And the practicalities, and this is the fun bit really, this is, this is where you get to dream. This is a lovely site because they've got this communal garden in the middle, which is a very safe space for play, which is sheltered by those uh, smaller dwellings there. And all around the outside are the more individual dwellings. A bit controversial, I think some of the, some of the um, homes are considered to be a bit of an eyesore by the local community, but you know, that's just a matter of opinion. And uh, I think that's one of the wonderful things about self-build, isn't it? It gives you potentially the freedom to do this kind of thing with the support of a group, and, uh, and, but also maybe have a bit of your own individual kind of flair in there. It's going all that bit of the model around here. Anyway, yeah, so that's, that's, that's probably, you know, a bit harder these days with COVID, but if you can get around a table 
just with pens, pencils and paper, site plans. You know, uh, we like to facilitate these kind of things, but by facilitate, I mean, I really want people to kind of start the design process on their own, you know. The architect is really just there in these, in these cases to manage the process, uh, to kind of steer it perhaps in directions where you are going more towards things that are more likely to get planning or other requirements, building regulations and warranties. But there's, you know, creativity that can come from the community group, which is something that can, is unrivaled, really, in terms of creating unique places. This is a different example. This one's in Stroud. This was architects planned and designed by a community group. They formed a uh, co-housing company. I think this was one of the first examples in the UK where they actually formed a specific co-housing company where they're all shared owners of the entire development. This was designed by Archetype. They're a very well-known architects in the world of uh, self-builds. They were very much born out of the Walter Siegel movement. Um, I think some of the founders of Archetype were actually working with Walter Siegel. Uh, don't quote me on that. Somebody else might know better. Um, they have very high standards of sustainability. And this, this lovely shared building, this is quite a common feature. So if you are looking at having a, a project and a site and you, you want to start thinking about where the heart of that might be, uh, in this case, right in the middle with uh, communal kitchens, workshops, um, I know they, they do do what well, they were doing when I visited, shared meals and things for the community, um, which is really lovely. And that kind of thing can be incorporated into the design at, at this early stage and can sort of form the backbone really off of what, which everything else can hinge. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone's been to that one in Stroud. That's quite, it's been there for a while now. It's, it's lovely. It's worth visiting if you can. The houses are really nice as well Sp the spaces are in the same way that Walter Siegel houses are quite open spaces but we're talking about design we're talking about the site plans but we're also talking about the spaces in which you're actually going to live they're very light and they've got lots of kind of double height spaces and, and three-dimensional spaces but they've also got that flexibility and adaptability in, in, in terms of their internal layout this is a more recent example um, not a very good image sorry about that this is lilac uh, which is low impacts living and community. Don't quote me on that. I may, may have got that wrong. They formed a mutual home ownership society. So a slightly different governance structure. I'm not really talking about governance structures here, but they, they are important in terms of how you manage the design process. Is anyone familiar with this one? This is quite well publicized recently. Yeah, lovely scheme. Really brilliant. Um, they've got a massive allotment area. They were lucky with this site, it's in Leeds, so I suppose it's probably a bit cheaper in, in the first instance anyway. I think it was contaminated land potentially, or uh, an old school grounds or something. I can't remember the details, but they, they managed to get the site, which is fantastic. And it's actually an urban site. So this is in the town. It's just a block basically surrounded by roads. They've got a lot of shared, um, facilities they've got lots of shared spaces so as I mentioned the allotments they've got green spaces and they've got this lovely pond in the middle they've got um, again a kind of communal house with uh, a dining area um, this for me is one of the best better examples I suppose as well here in terms of design this is built using modular straw bales white design we are architects of this they're fantastic um, and that's very much their system and their style. So here the design is less by the community, but the community have been involved in the kind of layout and the idea about what's included. The design of the buildings themselves is standardized. That's generally to sort of help reduce costs, uh, improve efficiency, especially if you group buildings together, you can certainly help reduce the energy costs um, and energy input. So there's a bit of a playoff there, and it's something that's worth thinking about before you even get into the design process, is really uh, what the objectives are for the whole scheme, as well as your individual sort of dreams. It can be worked out together, but it can be a very lengthy process. Um, does anyone have any questions about that one or comments on that one there? That's, I think that's a nice point for discussion. I think one of the interesting aspects um, of Lilac is, um, yes, it was on an old school site, 
but it was what a site that had been rejected by the developer because of the fact that it had a sewerage pipe running through the center of it and it was actually the group's idea to create the suds pond um. above the uh, the sewerage pipe and actually make it into a major feature of the site and i think that's a really great example of how you know community led thinking um you know can actually you know turn something that's a, a problem into a feature yeah yeah creative responses to problems where where a developer might kind of look at a site and say oh i can't you know it's not going to be viable because of this problem the community group may be able to work around that and look out for those sites where there are potentially uh, quirks that may turn off developers because they're the ones that may be more available I'm sure you're all aware, but when a site is up for uh, up for sale and if a developer is interested in it, it's very difficult to get hold of it because of how much money they're willing to put into it, you know, and how much money a community group is able to raise. So I think they probably talked about that in the finance section. This <clears throat> is a different model, though, that helps you get around those kind of problems. This is in Cambridge. Uh, it's called K1. I think that was just the name of the plot that the council were selling off. It's designed by Mole Architects and the developer is, uh, slipped my mind, I'll put it in the references. Basically here, there's a community group, but they actually just thought, you know what, we're gonna approach a developer <clears throat> to lead the project and design it and, and, and to sort of see it through really. And then we will buy into the scheme as um, members and then we'll be able to live in the scheme. So it's not an affordable housing scheme. I think these are quite um, high end really. It's quite a, a high end development, but it is a shared ownership through membership and with shared facilities and shared spaces, which you know is a common feature of many of these schemes. Off, off, off uh, site, off, off dwelling parking, if you like, um, there to give more, I love this, view of the street which is the car free road that they have you know uh which feels really kind of communal and uh, uh and a, self, a safe area to play in uh this is an interesting one really um, sorry jonathan can i yeah. just interrupt one minute there's five minutes left oh, really? yeah it's going very 11. quickly these i'm sessions. near the end don't worry yeah um is this, if, if you're interested in this, it's worth looking into just because it's a very different way of governance and organising the kind of financial background and the, the sort of how you actually manage the scheme. Uh, this is another one of, in a similar vein to that, so I won't go into it in too much detail. It's a lovely scheme. Six families here grouped together. They managed to find a bit of a backland site in London and then they, and then they commissioned an architect, I think, to basically run with it. Uh, and obviously they were inputting into the design process, but it wasn't so much self-build, so I won't go into that too much. I think there were elements of self-finishing and sort of self-furnishing uh, in order to save costs. Mainly it was uh, kind of um, architect-led, yeah. This is Russ, uh, because we're short of time, and I think maybe lots of you are familiar with this, uh, I won't go into it in too much detail. It's a lovely scheme. It's currently ongoing. I think they've got land now assigned over to them uh, from the local council. Uh, it's a large scheme and it will provide lots of affordable housing and uh, opportunities for community in the local area. Um, again, that's by archetype. So, that, you know, watch out for that. That's going to be a good, good project. Don't know if you had any comments on that one, anyone who's been involved in that, probably people here might know more about that than me. Okay, uh, I'll move on. Uh, this, we talked about Harberton, uh, Joanne's project there. Uh, the design process here was again, that there was a group of interested people who, uh, who kind of got together, but then it was architect designed in the sense that each of the homes is similar and again that's in order to sort of reduce the cost of expenditure uh, so but there are elements of self-build in this and then finally i was going to talk about the springfield orchard project the different model again here actually the people who are living in this development won't be necessarily the people who i've been working with in the design process so the design has been south dartmoor community energy and they've represented the local community but they have done extensive consultations with the local community in order to kind of work out what's uh, what's required 
and, and what people would like in that development. I'll um, leave it there. And um, this was a more detailed plan, but it's probably not worth going into. Uh, yeah, should we open the floor to questions? Uh, in particular, I'd like to know which of those people like most and also what kind of process people envisage working best for them. Don't know if people just want to jump in or if you raise your hands, then we can sort of, I don't know if anyone's already got their hand raised. Yeah. I want to say that I, this design is, uh, is wonderful, this 3D view of the site. I love the kind of the features and everything, the way it's laid out and everything. It's just, you know, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, it's a really exciting scheme. Landscape is, I mean, I can't really take much credit because it's more of a landscape design scheme. And actually there was somebody in the previous session who, who was a um, local uh, parish councillor who said they'd previously been a landscape designer and worked for local council, you know, to, uh, like worked in planning authority critiquing schemes. So I'll try and get them to, but we have a very good uh, landscape architect involved in the scheme who's worked quite hard on making sure these spaces are going to work for the community. Yeah, I've got a hand up there. Also, yeah, sorry, sorry. the moderator wants to just say if anyone's got their hand up. Simon? Yeah, I've just sort of noticed that none of these schemes are in Kent. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, why is that? That's, that is actually because Kent is just not um, really, not, have, have, have just haven't been working on community-led housing for very long. Okay. Um, we've been to, to, that's why, you know, we've established the hub really to try to um, uh, you know, raise awareness of community-led housing as well as other mm. things, because it's just not something that has really been happening here. And um, but there are a lot more groups now. So although there are quite a few community-led housing groups now in Kent, but they're in the earlier stages, most of them. So you know they're in the process of developing. But um, I think generally Kent can be a little behind in some, you know, especially in sustainable design and sort of communities getting together and doing their own housing so but I, I think that's slowly changing but that's why there, there aren't really many any real examples to give in Kent at the moment so not a money lady <laughs> um, Jonathan. Jonathan you've got your, your hand up you, you asked us um, which which of the developments we preferred and, and our opinions on it. I mean, I liked all of them. They were, but, but, the, thing is, but the thing is, you, you're, you're kind of, I just feel slightly, I mean, they were going through quite quickly. So the one is kind of overwhelmed the amount of information and decisions that you have to make and not knowing when you have to make those decisions. It's very difficult to, um, yeah, well, where do you start kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's probably a bigger question please feel free to get in touch with any of us who've organized this event uh, i know that at kent community housing hub have got lots of resources about that um in particular you know um really the starting point is is to find you know if you're forming an interested community group and the next biggest thing really is, is finding a site that you can all agree on as being you know location size of development um they're the two main starting points. I think at that point, you can start to kind of really get into the, into the dreaming and designing. And you can even start to dream and design from the beginning, you know, get together with your local community groups if you're doing this as a community and um, talk about what your ambitions are really. And, and maybe, uh, yeah, I mean, this presentation will be shared. There's some good resources here to start, to start with. Uh, there's lots of people to contact you know we're just one architect who specializes in this but there's there's some other fantastic architects you know who, who do this kind of stuff uh, i know that we we are very interested in doing this kind of work and we we're quite happy to offer pro bono advice on you know where to get started how how to approach the whole thing really so yeah great thank you yeah, just get in touch yeah Pictures iPad, did you want to? Yes, uh, um, jo uh, Jonathan, you mentioned find a site first and then start thinking about how to develop it. But my worry would be 
say you find a site, then you have to find the funding. And how do you secure a site when you don't even have the money? You know, and it's, it's most sites are rare than hen's teeth where I live in Kent, which is Thanet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've seen sites in the past, but not necessarily had the money to buy them, or a group of friends not necessarily yeah. had the money to buy them. And before you know it, we should have gone to a developer who plonks 20 sort of shitty little chicken coops on them. It's yeah. very, very uh, difficult to go after land that is commercially viable yeah. for an affordable scheme. So you are looking for exception sites or things that uh, commercially maybe are too small or or have got issues with them. And then and then you have to option them. So you don't buy them. You actually then tr negotiate to secure an option on them. And the okay. option doesn't the option doesn't convert typically until unless you get planning. And then that's the moment that you have to have the money to buy the land. But it, it, it takes you so the issue there is that when you are then raising pre-development finance to um to go towards planning you have you've you you have to have an op you, you know you option the land and then you all of that planning work and all of those um uh reports and everything that you commission the architects and so on is obviously all around that piece of land um and 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 that's why you need that op that option on there so if you okay. do get planning it converts but 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 it is a risk and the pre-development finance is always at risk to whoever, wherever you get it from, in case you, if you don't get planning, sure. Um, and it, in a way, it's that that's the riskiest part of any of the financing. So you have to go to certain kinds of bodies who provide that initial money, and you know, I think uh, there's, there's some more bits of funding open opened up at that, but you are looking really at grant funding. Okay, thank you. Year. Um, the. Uh... Am I on mute? The, um, the Community Housing Fund is restarted again, I think from April. There's not as much money as there was uh, previously uh, to get a lot of groups going, but um, there will be some more assistance for the early early stages. Um, uh, there is, to, just to get going and to help, help people in these very early stages, it's opened again, yeah. Um, can I just say quickly that um, th there's been quite a bit of focus on rural exception sites here, generally just because the sites you're talking about with those, but obviously that's not suitable for people in urban areas. Sure. We are, and this is not just a blatant advertising, but we are doing another uh, event on community-led housing in urban areas in a couple of weeks' time as well, which is kind of more specifically urban, because I think in terms of sites, um, in rural areas, you're very lucky if you can use exception sites, but there, there's, so, there's a lot of conditions that they have to be for local people, etc. So a group of random people can't get together and use it uh, and, and get an exception site because they won't have a connect, connection to the area. Yeah, yeah. and that's and that's also local people who are probably on the housing register if it's that you're providing uh, affordable social housing. That, so that's quite specific. Yeah, that's true. But don't forget that the community groups don't always, and developers don't always set up to benefit their own members. I mean, that's the thing, you set up the groups and it may not be you who actually is able to uh, benefit from, from these homes as yeah. in all the members personally. And you sort of have to separate that those those out a little bit, I think, sometimes. Yeah, I think that's the difference between a community land trust and, for instance, a co-housing scheme or yeah. a cooperative where it is for the member, it is for the pe the members, whereas a CLT is, goes out to the wider community. Yeah, yeah that's right. So, yeah. 10 seconds left, I think. But um, yeah, from a design perspective, that's really, that's a big distinction because you've got people who are either designing for themselves or they're designing as a kind of for others. So yeah, anyway, I think we're going now. Thank you. Oh, yeah, return. Okay, we are all back in the main room. Thank you, everyone. I hope those breakout sessions were useful to you. Um, we are going to now have another Q and A, um, I believe. Uh, is that right? Is that what we're doing? Another Q and A. I think we're looking at um, there may be five points from each room that was uh, that sort of came out quite strongly. 
got excited and scribbled all over my notes. Right, okay, so who wants to take the, um, so the planning session firstly, the breakout room planning session, who's gonna um, take us through the key five points from planning, is it Hannah? Hi, yeah, um, so we actually ran out of time for questions at the end of that session. So we don't really have um, themes that we, were able to discuss, but it would actually be a really good opportunity to ask any questions um, for Jonathan now that anyone did have that we weren't able to answer. All right, does anyone have a question from the planning Q&A? Put your hand up if you do. Uh, sorry, the planning session. Is there anyone there? can't see anyone immediately or I can just give a sort of five point summary for those who weren't there okay uh, you know uh the first is really engaging the local authority getting pre-application advice once you've got the kind of uh, agreement on the site um probably doing that quite quickly um engaging all necessary consultants uh can be quite time consuming so it's worth trying to get on top of that or certainly get somebody to manage that early on um, look at all the local policy requirements, very important to get to grips with what, what's required from the policy in the local area. Uh, community consultation, do it quickly, you know, do it before you've even really developed the design with the broader community, get people on board, get support for the scheme. And um, yeah, engaging good, good consultants, I think is, you know, a, a sort of design leaders, architects and project managers mm -hmm. can be very helpful to help get that through, get that going quickly because you can spend a long time developing a planning application and the design for the planning application, but okay. the planning application may not be successful. So, you know, get, get it, get it going, get, get talking to the planning authority <laughs> about things. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, Nick just mentioned there that um, Simon, you had your hand up and I didn't see you. Would you like to ask Jonathan a question? Yeah, I just sort of wondered whether there was like a register that the council ran for rural exception sites or or even urban sites. What's the quickest way of finding a site? Do you want me uh, to answer that in terms of rural exception sites in Kent? The way it works in Kent. Yeah, is it's different, isn't it? Different local authorities have different ways of listing out land. Yeah, I mean, there, there were, exception sites aren't really listed. It is a matter no. of finding them. So it's okay. doing a site search within a parished area and then, you know, approaching landowners. So, um, yeah, that's definitely... You can advertise as well. It's worth advertising. Yeah, sure. Do a call See for what sites. Comes call. We did yeah. a call. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's no actual list, though, in Kent of exception. Okay. All right. There are available development sites. That different councils do it differently, but... Um, they're ones that are usually earmarked for larger developments, so it's not necessarily that mm -hmm. useful. It's a good starting point yeah. as well. Nick, Nick's got his hand up there as well, Nick. So could you just expand, um, Tessa or Joanne, on, on the call? You just say, we want a site? Yeah, you, you just advertise locally or advertise wherever you think is appropriate for a site. And in, in actual fact, it was a requirement for us to have advertised. So even though we knew that um, that a farmer would would be generous enough to sort of bring his site forward for us we still actually had to advertise because we had to make the argument um going through the planning process that this was the site that was the best site for the scheme in this village and we were successfully able to do that and other sites did come forward but they were more difficult so they're more prone to flooding that sort of thing okay great thank you joanne Okay, um, so from the um, from the funding workshop that Joanne presented, um, really the five the five points that um, we took out of that was um, what what the aim of of that scheme was. So the target there was to complete houses at two thirds of market value um, within within the scheme, um, and questions about governance and. Incre the increasing demands as the project progresses um, on the scheme having done the proper due diligence. Um, and Joanne sort of said there that, you know, 
you you can't know everything at once but as it as it progresses those demands do increase and then we went on to pre, the pre-development grant from the district council um and joanne said that their her district council have been incredibly supportive um which i think is um, sort of always, always worth noting really that you know they're, they're there to work work with you and um coming out of that or creating a really strong relationship there is so important um joanne also mentioned the trickiest part of the whole process the land purchase and how difficult it was to um put funding in place so the pre-development funders weren't interested up until the point uh, before you bought the land i think that's right joanne wasn't it what i was saying is that um you know pre-development finance won't buy the land for you mm. so that's one set of finance you can get up to planning permission but they're not interested in the money that's going to buy you the land yeah. and similarly and um, typically um development finance has not uh, has only come in when you own the land you can see the problem there yeah um i, I think that i saw that now we're funding land purchase my experience is as time's gone on through community house building that funders have learned to plug the gaps and they've understood a bit more better where the issues come and they've created a, a bit of a better journey mm. but um yeah so we were um, managed to get our land money from our, our local district council yeah yeah um and finally the, the fifth point there is um to uh be aware of um, certainly from Joanne's experience with um, one of her funders, Kath Venturesome, that if you haven't used the money, you'll probably either have to give it back or there will be some kind of in penalt uh, interest penalty or, or something along those lines. So yeah, that so that's on loan money, on loan rather than grant money. But right. grant money, obviously, if you don't do anything with it and you, you haven't done what you were supposed to do with it, you do have to give it back. So mm. they, all, they all have a sort of a long stop and uh, dates on, on them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Hannah, I don't know if Hannah is still with us. She had an issue with her laptop then. Um, Jonathan, maybe could you just summarise the um, self-build, self-design breakout session for us? Um, yeah. Um, I'll try. I think some of the main questions were about uh, where to start, really. And I think that probably comes also a bit back to funding and finding a site and forming a community group and the government's issues around that. Okay. Um, we just talked about different models for organising um, community-led developments and design processes that are associated with those. So be it, you know, that there's actually a group of people who are interested in building homes for themselves and how that might look and how that might play out versus you know community group who might just kind of approach a developer and get the developer to kind of lead on the whole thing and maybe they're just involved in some of the decision making processes yeah um, so we run through that and we've talked about a few different schemes mm -hmm. um i think everyone uh yeah there was a you know it, it's just lots of aspirational images really of different things that people have been doing as well so mm -hmm. yeah okay just, great you know, inspire Tessa, did you have a couple of notes from, from that second session as, as well? Anything pertinent that you think? Mm, we just with? thought, we just really, we did, we, what I, I mentioned, um, the fact that, you know, it's quite a difference if you're using an except, rural exception site or you're looking for an urban scheme mm -hmm. uh, or an urban site um, in terms of um, uh, uh, price as well, as well as anything else and that, you know, exception sites aren't, suitable for for everybody yeah. um, unfortunately okay all right thank you um and from the sustainability um breakout session there um donal ran us through um insulation vent ventilation and air tightness first of all including some uh low carbon heating systems um and just really talking about how each each of them as wonderful as they sound um will have a drawback um and then we went on to water rainwater harvesting um, and things like low flow taps efficient wcs and appliances and the importance of incorporating those into your scheme um materials how government policy incentivizes the use of certain materials 
um, and then on to um, ecology and the positive impact of building housing, which um, doesn't seem like the most sort of logical statement initially, but how planting hedgerows and enhancing the biodiversity um, in and around the scheme really does have that huge positive impact um, on, on the ecology of the area and of the scheme as a whole. So that was the sessions just summarised there, but just a reminder that they will all be available hopefully on the new YouTube channel <laughs> and uh, that will be made available in a day or so. So now we are going to go to a 15, possibly 15, maybe 20 minutes, depends how many questions come out of that Q&A session. So who would like to start? I'm going to keep my eye on everyone who's got their hand up. Any questions, please, for our presenters? I think I saw Anne's hand up earlier, but I don't know if that's passed now. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Jeff's got his hand up here. Yeah, sorry, that was on a different subject, so I'll, I'll okay. leave it, thanks. Are you sure? You can put it in the chat, Anne, if you'd like to. OK, Jeff? Sorry, are we doing a particular topic now? No, I'm just going to make is a... all okay. open. I was... Can I put forward my suggestion for the Kent planners? Uh, there's room for about half a million people on the Isle of Green, on the hoop. Sorry. Can you unmute, Jeff? Please? Oh, sorry. Yeah, right. OK. Um, this is a off-the-wall suggestion. Uh, there's room for about half a million people on the Hoo Peninsula. So why not open the, the railway line to All Hall Hallows and uh, put some nice um, settlements of uh, the, the type that Donald was talking about uh, with no cars and, and uh, you, you're within about 40 minutes of um, Canary Wharf and, and the centre of London. So, that you, so you could have a bit of um, export trade, if you like, or outworkers. But wouldn't it be nice to redevelop the area to be really ecologically sound? It would, indeed. Thank you, Jeff. It really would. Fran, let's have your question, please. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about funding um, the community facilities part of a development or where you're providing workspace, because it's, it's much more difficult to get funding for that aspect of the development. Can I ask if anyone where people have got funding for those kinds of things from? Okay, who would like to answer that question from Fran? We've got a workshop on our on our scheme planning permission for a sort of community workshop, which we're obviously going to need as well. We will build that first, as it were, so that self builders can use that. I actually hadn't thought about that point whether it was going to be difficult to to find money to actually build that as part of our scheme. I'm not anticipating it would be because I think that the building society will lend to us as a developer. And then when we sell portions of the houses, as it were on, we as a developer will still retain a loan, as it were, on our scheme. So it, it will be part of that. That's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping happens. Okay, great, I thank think you. I think Sophie had maybe had something to yeah. say about that as well. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the answer either. Uh, we've got quite a large community hub building on our site. And um, yes, and because of all our home, predominantly our homes will be socially rented, which means the income from them will be very low. Um, we haven't got to that stage of knowing exactly what's going to happen with it yet. Um, but yeah, there are separate grants that can fund community facilities. So that's what I'm exploring at the moment. Um, so yes, wait and see, but I'm not sure yet. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Sophie. Donal, you've got your hand up there. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. um, yeah. Just, just something that's from, I mean, it's not something we're doing on Harbison, but I think Sophie and those guys are looking at more, is, is a community share offer, or basically giving, if, if you're talking about that kind of space, <clears throat> you know, whether you could raise maybe equity finance, to have that, that owned by by the community and they would receive, I mean, the, 
one of the good things about community finance is it tends to be the type of money that people are often not too sharkish about. So, you know, you, you, you explain to them that they may see a dividend eventually, but that you can, you know, access fairly low cost money through the fact that people want to see that type of building in their community and therefore it's not quite gifting it, but you, you know, it can be probably a lot less risky, if you like, than going down the bank route because the bank will want to see its money back, you know, at 10% a year on. And yeah, so I, I think that could, could be an important route in kind of parceling off bits of the development for community ownership, potentially, if you want to bring forward workspaces, whatever type of space you want to, you know, you want to create. Um, yeah, personal okay. view. But. Lovely, thank you, Donal. Um, Anne, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, if what you're providing in terms of um, a community building or, or whatever um, helps to meet an existing need within the community, um, there are a couple of routes you might consider. If there's development nearby that is not on site meeting the needs for community buildings, you can negotiate with the developer and the local authority for off-site contributions that can be put to your project. Also, if uh, in the circumstances where there is an existing deficit uh, and you can engage the, the parish council as a stakeholder in the project, parish councils find it relatively easy to borrow money as a deathless corporation. And if there's a demonstrated benefit to existing residents, they may be able to reclaim some of the interest or some of the debt um, or repay it through a slight increase in the parish precept. And you find if residents, existing residents are getting something back for that, they won't object too much. Okay. Thank you, Anne. Okay, do we have any other questions? Simon. I thought it might be interesting to have a little um, comment from uh, Joanne and Sophie on timescales. I'm curious to know how long you've been at it and how <laughs> have you kept your energy, um, you know, to keep going? Great question. Sophie? Yeah, uh, we first had the idea in 2017, okay. um, so four years ago. Uh, and yeah, it's as you probably all aware, like trying to do it in a community organisation with a bunch of volunteers who also have day jobs it's really very difficult to keep motivated and keep going so for us even though we're a community and partly voluntary organization it's been really important to get grants so that we can pay people to project manage partly mm. because our, our directors of our organization are all kind of none of us are retired we're all working so we need to still earn a living and we can't do it for free um but yeah it's it's getting grants to pay somebody to keep things moving forwards. And the Homes England grant that we got, um, we had £87,000 for our pre-development grants. And that without that, and actually without a sustainable design collective, like Jonathan's been absolutely incredible getting our, he's managed the whole process with all of the consultants and got the planning application in. So getting the right architects, the right people on your team and sticking to your vision. So with our technical consultants at the moment, they're coming at me saying, oh, you, you can't do this, you can't do that, it's too expensive. We have to keep going back to the board and saying, what do we really want to do? And, and yeah, clear idea of your vision and aims and the right people and money. <laughs> Lots of money. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, Joanne, do you want to do you want to answer Simon's question on that one as well? Yeah, I mean, I was only about 18 when we started this process. No, actually, it's not that long, but it feels like it. I think uh, it's about seven years or something like that. Um, and I mean, oh, we're we we're totally voluntary. You know, I'm I've got a day job. I've always had a day job, and similarly, the vice chair and the, the directors. Um, we've leaned a lot, obviously, uh, sustainable design collective. Don Donald and Bill John Jonathan's quite new on the scene, actually. Um, have 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 really pushed it along. They've been very patient with it. I think if we'd have had, uh, you know it was run by a member of staff as it were it would have gone quicker 
I, I, I would definitely say my bad in terms of um, sometimes when it slowed down because I've been really busy at work or whatever, but other, other considerable factors have come into play as well. And sometimes you just can't get all the pieces of the jigsaw in place to do the next bit, uh, finance being one of them. Um, get, getting through planning was a bit of an agony um, because of our highways issue. Um, and we've had a, our, our landowner is incredibly busy and it is quite hard to to actually to actually it's been hard to get that final land transaction done. But I always say I think I'm hoping that actually the build phase is going to be the easiest. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but I mean, one of the things I always think the next phase is going to be the easiest phase. But yes. um, I, I don't really have any problem keeping the enthusiasm. It's phenomenally interesting and I think the scheme in the end and, and the homes will be amazing. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Joanne. Um, we are, I see someone's put in the chat there um, about um, keeping in touch for networking um, and where's it gone? Where's it gone? Um, we, there we go. Jonathan, Jonathan Hill. Um, I see that you are interested in co-housing. We are hosting a co-housing event for um, groups very shortly. Um, I think it's towards the end of February. I think it's 23rd of February. Um, I'm going to post a link to the Eventbrite booking page. Um, and we are trying to keep it as much as possible for um, members of co-housing groups, existing members or individuals interested in starting their own um, co-housing group. Uh Kirsty, it's um it's for all community-led housing basically. So <laughs> any yeah any um any any is this is a networking for groups who are, uh, who are involved in any type of community-led housing to kind of get together, meet each other. So you might already be in a group, or you might be interested in joining a group. Yeah. So yeah, it's for any type, but we're trying to restrict it to groups and people interested in joining groups um, for this for the first meeting. Right, lovely. I, I can't get that wrong. <laughs> um, I am CLH Groups Networking Event. I'm just going to post the um, link up now. Do we have any other questions from, from the floor? Uh, would anyone like to, to ask anything else? So I'm just going to move my chat window. Please do put your hand up if you would like to ask anything. Okay. Right, okay, what I'm going to do now then is I'm going to post up those links. I would um, ask as many of you as possible to um, subscribe to the uh, King Community Housing Hubs website and I'm also going to post that link up as well. Um, so here is the Community Led Homes networking event link. Um, and if you'd like to be kept up to date with future events that we're running, we've got quite a few coming up, please do subscribe to our website. Um, and we also have a um, urban community-led uh, community homes um, session, which is on Tuesday the 23rd of Feb. And the link for that is here also. So just please to, do sorry, sign up. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Well, it, just to say, if anybody has uh, a site or a scheme or site they're looking at and wants a bit of free consultation advice, we, we're really happy to put, sort of provide that. And if you do have anything, you know, you want to take forward, we'd be really interested in, in, in working with you, basically. So, yeah, just let yeah. us know. I think maybe our contact details will come through. We can send that probably through the email chain or something can't we? but uh, yeah thanks very much yeah. and I'll, so, I'll send out all the, all the links as well to sustainable design collective and the CLTs that presented today in the email when um, I send around the YouTube link as well so you'll have have all those all those links together um, and finally just a really huge thank you for all of you to come in and to our presenters for presenting and sharing their knowledge and experience we really really appreciate it and um, I really hope that you all have a great weekend. Thank you.